Members, good morning. Good morning. I think as probably as all of us, I'm struggling to have some the, I'm struggling to kind of have all of the evidence and information around us. Sort of piles of papers. But good morning, members, officers, and any members of the public who are viewing the live stream. Welcome to this meeting of the South Cambridgeshire District Council Planning Committee. My name is Councillor Pippa Halings, and I'm chair of the committee. So, can those present in the council chamber note that everything on your desk, including your laptop screen, is likely to be broadcast at some point? Just be aware of that. The camera, as we know, follows the microphone being switched on. So, councillors and officers are requested to wait a couple of seconds before speaking to allow the camera to catch up, especially when I ask your name and especially when you're um, asking to speak. Um, if the fire alarm sounds, please leave the chamber and make your way down the stairs. Do not use the lift and the safe assembly point is next to the marketing suite halfway along the business park. Um, can those who are participating in the live stream um, indicate that you wish to speak via the chat column? My vice chair um, will be taking that down as well as all of those who are in the chamber raising their hand to speak. And as we know, he does that extremely proficiently and fairly, so we, we won't be having any questions on that. Um, please make sure that your device is fully charged, that you switch your microphone off unless you're invited to do so. Otherwise, there's people on the live stream um, and that you've switched off or silenced any other devices as well. And as requested yesterday by email, please use a headset if available when speaking and hold the microphone close to your mouth. When you're invited to address the meeting, those on live stream, please make sure your microphone is switched on. When you finish addressing the meeting, please turn off your microphone immediately. And please speak slowly and clearly, and do not talk over or interrupt anyone. Um, please note, if we do need to vote on any item, which we do, we shall do so via the system of the microphones, um, and that will be publicly um, available immediately. But only those present in the chamber can vote or propose or second recommendations. So, Committee members now present in the chamber, I'll invite each of you to introduce yourselves. After I call your name, please um, turn on your um, camera and microphone, wait two seconds, and say your name so that your presence may be noted. So as I said, my name is Councillor Pippa Halings. I'm the member for Histon, Impington and Orchard Park. I'm chair of the planning committee. Um, and I'd like to invite now my vice chair, Morning everyone, Councillor Henry Batchelor, one of the members for the Linton Ward and Vice Chair of this committee. Thank you very much. Councillor Dr Martin Kahn. <coughs> Councillor Dr Martin Kahn, a member for Histon Impington Orchard Park. Thank you very much. Councillor Dr Claire Daunton. Um, yes, I'm uh, Councillor Claire Daunton and I'm one of the members for the Fen Ditton and Holborn Ward. Thank you very much. Councillor Peter Fain. Good morning, Peter Fain, Shelford Ward. Thank you very much. Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins. Good morning. Um, Toomey Hawkins, uh, Caldicott Ward. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Councillor Judith Griffith. Good morning. Councillor Judith Griffith, and I represent the Milton and Waterbeach Ward. Thank you very much. Councillor Deborah Roberts. Good morning, Chairman. Good morning, everybody. Deborah Roberts, um, Councillor for the Foxton Ward. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Heather Williams. Heather Williams and I represent the Mordens. Thank you very much, Councillor Dr. Richard Williams. Thank you, Chair. I'm Richard Williams. I'm the member for Whittlesford Ward. Thank you, Councillor Eileen Wilson. Good morning. Um, I'm Eileen Wilson, Councillor for Cottenham and Grantham. Thank you very much. Are there any other members present um, with us on the live stream? Okay, thank you very much. Um, and I can confirm that the meeting is quorum. We have everybody here, which is wonderful. Um, we also have two officers in the chamber. Chris Carter. Good morning, everybody. Chris Carter, Delivery Manager for Strategic Sites. Thank you very much. And Stephen Reed. Uh, morning, Chair. Morning, Microphone. And again. Uh, morning, Chair. Good morning, members. And Stephen, can I ask that when you, you may need to sort of bring your either the microphone forward or not blocked by your laptop. Sorry about that. We just may need you in this meeting. <laughs> but if we can, we can hear you, so that would be good. Thank you very much. Um, 
if at any time a member leaves the meeting, would they please make the facts known to me and through my vice chair so that they're recorded in the minutes. And I intend breaking for 15 minutes at about 11.30, um, and if the meeting's still going on, at about 3.30, and I propose we have a 45-minute break for lunch at about 1.15, and we'll, we'll check that as we're going on in terms of the, the agenda. Um, and members, may I check that you have the papers issued for the meeting on 8th of September? One and two. And a supplemental, which was issued for this meeting as well, um, and draft minutes of the meeting held on 11th of August was circulated um, and for adoption today, and were available on the, the website, as I understand. Good. Thank you. Um, agenda item two, apologies. Oh, Ian Senior. Yes. I'm very sorry, <laughs> Ian. Oh, my goodness. Uh, would you please introduce yourself, Ian Senior? Yes, Ian Senior, Democrat Services uh, at the meeting today, taking the minutes and Thank giving you. you some apologies, I think. Yeah, before, uh, so that, before that, Ian, um, would you confirm whether this is your last meeting with us? Uh, it, it isn't. Uh, we're, 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 getting, we're getting there, but uh, I'll be back uh, in two weeks' time. I'll be back. Good. Thank you very, very much, Ian. And so, yes, apologies. Agenda item two. Yes. Apologies from Councillor Jeff Harvey, and his substitute is Councillor Dr Claire Daunton. Thank you very much. Thank um, you. Thank you very much, Ian. And agenda item three, declarations of interest. Thank you, Chair. Just on the enforcement report, item 12, um, as the local member, I have been involved quite extensively with the Whitehall Farmhouse thing. Yes. Good. That's from there. And Councillor Marachi. Thank you, uh, Chair. Two, sorry, three to declare. Um, one on item six and seven, which is uh, the same site. Um, I have a pecuniary interest here because my employer has an ongoing business relationship with the applicant. So on legal advice, I will be withdrawing from the chamber for those two items and not taking any part in the debate or vote. Um, and item eight, again, another application in Linton. Um, following the flooding back in July, I have had several meetings with residents who are effect being affected by the application. I think one of them is speaking to us today, um, but that doesn't preclude me from taking any part in the debate, but I wanted to declare that as an interest. Thank you very much. And oh, yes, Councillor Reid, also. Um, it's not a substantive item. We're not voting on it, but I'm the local member. Um, agenda item 10 uh, is a report on Water Beach New Town East. Thank you very much. And Councillor Deborah Roberts. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, shouldn't we all declare an interest on the Fuse Lane one? Um, because we've seen it on numerous occasions, but we come to it afresh. I, I was just thank about you. to say the same. Thank you very much. I agree with that. If that's noted, thank you very much. Councillor Dr. Tumi Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, as always, with anything with Bonn Airfield, um, I declare an interest. Um, I'm probably the one who lives closest to it. Thank you very much. Also well known. Thank you very much. Um, we now go on to the minutes um, and the minutes of the last meeting members. So we have the minutes for the, as I understand, and can you help me on this one, Ian? So it's the meeting, minutes of the meeting held on the 11th of August and the 8th of September. So we'll take the meetings held, the minutes of the meeting held on the 11th of August, first of all, which... Thank you, Chair. Um, on, on the meeting of the 11th of August, at the, um, the last paragraph on the first page, it says that Councillor Ali Wilson declared non-pecuniary interests. Um, it says that I discussed both of these cases with Councillor Milgoth, but in fact, the first case, um, Gerton, Western Huntington Road, I discussed with Councillor Corinne Garvey. Ah, it being Gerton. Yep. So we can make that amendment. Thank you very much. Any further 
Councillor Jacob. Um, I just need to abstain from the length of August minutes because I wasn't present. Thank you. Councillor Martin Khan. I, I will need to abstain as well because I wasn't present on the 11th of August. Thank you, members. Can I take that by affirmation that those minutes are agreed? Agreed. Agreed. And now we go to the minutes for the 8th of September, um, which were in our public in our reports pack, agenda item. Do we have any comments on this agenda? Thank you, Chair. Um, I wasn't present at, on the 8th of September, so I'll be abstaining from the minutes. Thank you. Any other? If not, can we take that by affirmation that the minutes have been agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now we'll go to the substantive items of the agenda. And um, on the first of these um, papers that we have, which would be agenda item five, which are pages seven to 388 of your agenda pack. And this is for application 20 slash 05101 slash Full, land at the retreat Fuse Lane, Long Stanton. The proposal is for the erection of a chalet bungalow with garage and associated infrastructure. The applicant is Mr. Jerry Kadu. Um, the key material considerations in front of us, members, are principle of development, impact on the character of the area, impact on residential amenity, highways matters, and other matters. It's not a departure. Um, and the application is being brought to the committee because the proposals raise significant concern, the proposal raises significant concerns locally and it's to be considered in the public interest for the application to be referred to the planning committee. The presenting officer is Lewis Tomlinson. Lewis, are you with us? Present Chair. Hello, Lewis. Hi, Chair, present. Thank you very much. Lewis, do you have any updates um, before giving us a summary of, of the application? Um, I will do it as part of my presentation. Thank you. Great, I'll just share my screen. Just bear with me one second. Can someone confirm they can see that, please? Yes, I can. It's in, right, we can see all of the slides. Oh, there we can, that's now. Uh, Aaron. Or you could just watch my expression. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. So the site is Fuse Lane. So it's land at the retreat Fuse Lane, as outlined in the red on the plan in front of you. So Fuse Lane comprises a single vehicular width grave service track. The lane currently serves as an access to a double garage serving 135 high streets. Um, <clears throat> the, <clears throat> excuse me, the Willows and two other recently constructed dwellings to the west of the tree. So the Willows is here and two recently constructed dwellings here, which are just to the west of the retreat. <clears throat> the lane varies in width and the lane runs alongside a tree lined with vegetated area to the north, with boundaries to a number 135 and willows to the south side. A footpath, um, a public right of way linking the home farm residential development to the south and west of Fuse Lane with High Street emerges onto the south side of Fuse Lane at a point to the immediate west of the willows. I'll just show you an aerial view of the site so you can see a public right of way here. Um, Fuse Lane here, two recently constructed dwellings. Here is the retreat and the site in question we're looking at today is this area to the rear of the retreat. Um, you've got the Willows here, a garage for 135 High Street and 135 High Street here and the entrance for Fuse Lane onto High Street. The site lies within the village framework. 
To the immediate north of the site is a drainage ditch, so Lon here, which outfalls to Lon Stanton Brook. The site is otherwise unconstrained. I'll just run through a couple of photos, um, just to give context. So this is a view up Fuse Lane from access of High Street. 135 High Street is on the left. This is taken from the High Street looking up Fuse Lane. The site is down here. This is a view along High Street past the frontage of Fuse Lane, looking north, Fuse Lane access on the left. Please note the traffic calming measures just here. View along High Street past the frontage of Fuse Lane, looking south, Fuse Lane access here on the right. This is a view along the High Street past the frontage of Fuse Lane, looking south with Fuse Lane on the right, taken from the entrance to Mitchcroft Road. Again, noting the traffic calming measures just here. Fuse Lane is just there. This is the Fuse Lane entrance looking towards the north. Again, you can see the traffic calming measures there. Fuse Lane entrance looking towards the south. <clears throat> This is looking down Fuse Lane, garage to 135 High Street and the Willows on the left. The site is just down here on the right. It's looking down Fuse Lane and the, you can see the retreat is on the right. In the background, you can see the recently constructed dwellings. This is the informal turn and head opposite the retreat. This is access onto Fuse Lane from the public right of way to Home Farm. And this is an existing site plan. So the proposal is um, for a single dead dwelling, chalet bungalow with garage and associated infrastructure. It would contain four bedrooms. So this is the proposed site plan here. So you can see just for context again, this is the retreat to be replaced by two dwellings. This is the two recent, recently constructed dwellings, and this is the site we're looking at today. Um, the proposal mirrors the recently constructed dwelling to the west, known as the Elms, with the same roof pitch and ridge height. It has a ridge height that is lower than the approved dwellings plots four and five to the south. So these are these two dwellings. It has a smaller footprint than the approved bungalow on the site, and yet still provides four usable bedrooms, given an increase in garden size. The proposed dwelling would exceed the internal floor space policy requirement and would also provide parking within the curtilage of the site and the ability to turn and leave the dwelling in forward gear. That's just a zoomed in version of the site plan. You can see the turning area here, garden here, and obviously the dwelling here. These are the proposed elevations. As you can see, chalet bungalow, with rooms contained within the roof space in the form of dormers on the front and a dormer on the rear. Please note there are no side windows on the first floor level. This is the floor plans, so you can see the ground floor plan on the left hand side of the screen and the first floor plan on the right hand side of the screen. So um, Members should be aware that the applicant has submitted an appeal to the planning inspectorate on the grounds of non-determination. As a result, the local planning authority no longer has the authority to determine the application. The local planning authority is required, however, to prepare a statement of case as part of the appeals process, setting out its evaluation of the planning merits of the proposal. Given the history of the site, the application would have been referred to the planning committee for its determination had the appeal against non-determination not be made. Officers are therefore bringing the application to planning committee in order that members can express the committee's minded to decision that will form part of the statement of case. The council has secured an extension until Friday this week to submit a statement of case to allow members to consider this application today at committee. Um, <clears throat> officers would like to point members towards the update report that cont contains additional representations from Fuse Lane Consortium and members should also note that Lonstanton Parish Council has changed their position from support to object. Members will also be aware of a complaint letter from Lonstanton Parish Council that related to the recent Section 73 application for the land to the front of the site. The response from Stephen Kelly to Lonstanton Parish Council is available on the website. 
Um, the day before the previous committee, um, officers were forwarded a highways engineer report by Crates Consultant Engineering on behalf of Fuse Lane Consortium, which concludes that any further development off Fuse Lane should not be permitted due to significant concerns related to the visibility and the existing site access arrangements. The local highway authority has late um, provided a response later that afternoon to Crates assessment. The response from the local highway authority concludes that there are no substantive highway reasons to recommend that the development be refused. The council also received a large number of emails in the morning of the planning committee, raised concern about the potential for the removal and cutting back of hedges to enable inter-vehicle visibility displays and the lack of consultation about this. Dr John Finney from the local highway authority will be available in committee today to answer any questions regarding the local highway authority's response to the application and in regards to crates assessment. Members should also note the update report sent yesterday. As previously outlined, the principal development of a dwelling on the site has been established through the granting of a application S slash 2937 slash 16 slash FL for appeal. The, applica the applicant confirmed on the 15th of September that this plan permission has now been implemented before the expiry date of the 27th of September 2021. There's also another planning permission on the site under S slash 2439 18 slash FL, which remains extent until the 25th of March 2022 and is yet to be implemented. Members should also note that Fuse Lane Consortium has submitted a cost application against the Council as part of the appeal. Within the cost application, Fuse Lane Consortium states it is seeking the cost of obtaining expert evidence to address the highway safety assessment that should have been conducted by the local highway authority as a statutory consultee. The Council needs to respond to this by the end of the 30th of September 2021, which is tomorrow. Officers are seeking delegated authority from members to issue a response to the cost application for the inspectorate to consider. There is an amended officer recommendation to reflect this. Officers have considered all other representations made by Fuse Lane Consortium and third parties over the course of the application. Officers do not consider that any of those representations alter the recommendation or the primary reasons for reaching this recommendation. So the recommendation is officers recommend that the planning committee determines that it would be minded to approve the application if it had authority to do so, subject to the conditions and informative as, as set out on page 24 of the 8th of September 2021 officer report. Officers also request delegated authority to submit a response to the cost application submitted by Fuse Lane Consortium dated the 23rd of September 2021 to the inspectorate for consideration on behalf of the council. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, and is our want, we will move to um, the public speaking now and any questions that we have for the planning officer, for the case officer will come in the, the time of the debate. Councillor Devereaux. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, I want some clarification here before we start this exercise. I mean, we've destroyed a forest in um, presenting this case, haven't we? Um, the trees must be groaning um, every time that they hear Hughes Lane. Mr. Deborah Roberts, can you just go to exactly what you think? So we will yeah, ask questions I'll, in the debate. I certainly will, Chairman. Um, I'd like to understand, really, uh, at that last meeting, which had to be abandoned uh, because of the technical problems, seemingly, um, I thought we were made, it was being made very clear to us that uh, we had to um, try and get something done that day because we were out of time. So um, I find it uh, questionable why we're now being told that we've asked for extra time and that has been given. I mean, it reeks of desperation, um, I'm afraid. So, Councillor and Roberts, if I can understand your question, which I will allow before we go, because it's not a debate one, it's the actual, the essence of what, you know, the timing that we're doing this under. If I, if I answered your question, you're saying, why, why do we have more time to look at this now when in the last meeting Chairman, it, was, uh, it was immediate? Uh, with respect, I will ask you to respect that I have a right to put a question in the, the manner that I would like to put it, but there is a definite question there, and that is, 
why was it that we were told categorically that um, the time was out within a, a very short period of time when we looked at it the other week, and now somebody has gone and, and asked for extra time. The second question that I would like answering is, we had great resistance from officers um, about allowing us to um, speak to Dr. John Finney. Dr. John Finney was uh, supposedly available last time, but there was an absolutely, in my opinion, concerted effort to not allow us to actually ask um, Dr. Finney at an early stage questions which, which are quite obvious um, needed answering before we um, actually go into it. So when is Dr. Finney going to be uh, available to members now? So thank you very much. So on the first question we'll take now. The second question, we will go into the debate and I'm chairing this meeting and there will be questions for Dr. Finney, which is why he's here. Can we just have a clarification of the issue around the additional, you know, where's this extension of time come in? Thank you, Chair. Um, at the time of the last meeting, the deadline that uh, the Council had from the Planning Inspectorate to respond uh, was, I believe, a day or two after the committee. Um, we had put in, um, a we put in a request for an extension to that time, um, but at the time of the meeting, um, no response had been received from the Planning Inspectorate. Um, following the abandonment of the meeting, um, officers again sought uh, agreement from the Planning Inspectorate to extend the time further in order that the committee would be able to express its views uh, on the application. Um, that was um, agreed, but not until after the original deadline had expired. Um, so we have a, an extension which enables the item to be reconsidered today, um, but at, at the time of the last committee, um, the deadline was more immediate. Now it's obviously been moved by the Planning Inspectorate to allow for the Council to, to respond. Can you clarify what the deadline is now? Uh, if you bear with me one moment, I can. Or possibly Lewis, if he knows it offhand. Thank you, Chair, for you. Um, so the new deadline is Friday the 1st of October, so two days from now. Um, just to expand on that, so at the last committee, we did have a deadline until the 10th of September, which was two days post committee. Um, Obviously, following the abandonment of committee, we did seek an extension both on the day of committee and the day after. No response was received. Um, so we just submitted the information to the inspector stating that we had no view of the council because members couldn't dis um, discuss the application due to technical issues. Um, following the 10th, the, we, considered, um, we continued to request an extension of time from the inspector. The inspector did agree one now until the 1st of October to allow this committee to happen. So following this committee, we will, we will submit a statement of case to the inspector for consideration. We've got two days after this one. That's it. Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. It's a procedural question. And I, like yourself, I wasn't at the previous meeting, so I, I don't know um, everything that went on in relation to questions. Um, but I just wanted to clarify whether this sort of change in, in procedure of when we ask for clarification, if this is permanent, because some people might think it's um, hilarious, but actually it's quite good to know as a committee member if, if this has changed, because it, it just sort of happened overnight, um, and also we were asked to do our questions in the debate, and I thought that was perhaps just for a couple of items um, it's not very clear if that's a permanent change, so whether we're being consistent here. So if I could have some clarification mm -hmm. from you, yeah. and actually whether that's something that can be done yourself as chair, or whether actually as a planning committee we should probably have a bit more input, because I, I find it useful to have the questions outside the debate, mm -hmm. because otherwise you end up in a situation where you're having to give an opinion before perhaps you've actually had time to digest the information. So for me, it might not, you know, for me personally, it doesn't quite suit. But um, yeah, how are we so going to answer the question? So as you know, I put this forward um, at a time when we were finding, we were duplicating the questions and the debate as well. The questions were coming back again. So I put it forward. Everybody agreed that we would do it for that meeting. Um, we have considered, in my opinion, we've had more efficient meetings since. We've had some very, very good meetings and some very good debates since. Um, I'm very happy that at the beginning of each committee meeting we put that to debate, you know, we put it to a motion and say, will we in this meeting, you know, allow for that? We also have the 
planning um, development group, we can raise it in there if it's something that you prefer. But for now, uh, what I'm happy to do is put this as a motion to say to everybody, are we happy that we continue in the way that I put forward earlier, but we have the questions in the debate? So I'll put that as a motion right now. So there's my motion. Um, all of those in favor? Sorry? Yes, seconder for that motion. Second. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, yeah, Councillor Henry Batchelor, for seconding that. Um, could we go to the vote on that, Aaron? Thank you. So this would be four if um, in this meeting we have the questions that are considered at the time of the debate. Okay, thank you. So that has, has passed with seven votes to four. Can I write this motion, please? Yes. Thank you very much. And we will take, Councillor Everett, your, your question with about pushing Dr. Dunkelme in the debate time. Thank you very much. I will now go to the public speaking. Um, and we have uh, Mr. Daniel Fulton, who is with us in the chamber. And there, Mr. Fulton, we can see you. Um, I'll, yes, and you are also available on the screen. You know the procedure by now that you have three minutes. Thank you very much. That's right. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I'd like to note that um, what Mr. Tomlinson said about a cost application is completely false. Fuse Lane Consortium has made no cost application against the local planning authority. That is, there is no basis at all for that. I don't know where officers got it from. In fact, the documents on the council's website specifically say that the application for costs has been made against the local highway authority, which is Cambridgeshire County Council. Officers have literally put in front of you stacks of hundreds of pages of documents, but officers apparently couldn't be bothered to actually read the cost application before submitting a report to you that is just a, a completely baseless. Um, if I could ask for the diagram of the visibility displays to be placed on the screen, please. Um, you do have a report, an independent report from uh, Create Consultant. Yes, if it's possible that you could display those. Um, you have a report from Create uh, Consultant Engineers. Um, the author of the report has 25 years experience in, work in working on, uh, this is not the correct diagram. Um, a new diagram was sent today. Um, Create Consulting Engineers, the author of the report, has 25 years as a highway engineer. Um, he visited the site. He considered all the evidence, including the extent of the boundary of the public highway. And the um, conclusions of Create Consulting Engineers are completely supported by evidence. The points made by Dr. Finney are not supported by evidence um, at all. Um, I'll wait for the diagram to come up. Lewis, I can understand if you receive something this morning, it may be difficult to bring this up. Can you just say yes or no when you can bring it up? Because I don't want to affect the timing that Mr. Fulton has for his three minutes. Just bear with me uh, yeah, one second. I'm just sorting it now. Apologies. That's, that's fine. I'll, I'll go ahead. Thank you. Um, the substantive problem here um, is that the evidence put before you today by officers ignores all of the areas that are actually in dispute in regards to the development, which is the impact upon highway safety. The visibility at the junction is simply inadequate. Anyone who has visited the site and has used the junction understands that it's extremely dangerous. All, I mean, there is zero visibility between vehicles exiting Fuse Lane and pedestrians moving along the pavement and cyclists and vehicles traveling north along High Street. It's extremely dangerous. Even the county council concedes that the visibility displays are obstructed. The county council says that it owns the hedges along High Street and has the right to remove them or trim them. If this is the case, why hasn't the, count, why hasn't the highway authority done so since 1962? Since 1962, we have residents who have lived next to Fuse Lane. At absolutely no time since then has the county council conducted any maintenance on this hedge. Dr. John Finney now says that the county council owns it. I think, I think that's completely baseless. Um, 
there's evidence um, submitted um, that officers did not submit to you that I had to submit myself um, that actually shows where the highway boundaries are. The position of the boundaries are a matter of law. You have to consider the evidence uh, in regards to where the highway boundary exists. Um, Dr. John Finney has, has consulted a uh, indicative ordinance survey map um, and has based all his conclusions on that. And if anyone knows anything about ordinance survey mapping, you know it is not accurate down to the details. Um, Mr. Fulton, I've given you a little bit beyond the three minutes because of I'll the map issue. I'll wrap it up. Yeah. Yes. So um, the bottom line is the local highway authority um, has had many different views on this application of visibility displays. In front of you, you will see a diagram with orange lines, blue lines, purple lines, and green lines. These are um, the different opinions that the local highway authority has had in regards to this development of this site over the past, uh, over the past eight years. Every time that the Can county- Can you please- Yes, I will. Every time the county council finds out that the applicant doesn't own land, it changes its highway safety recommendation. The conclusions of the local highway authority are not based on highway safety. They are based on the unlawful consideration of what land is owned by the applicant. The council has bungled this completely. I feel sorry for all of you that you have to consider it again today. Thank you. Thank you very much. And do we have any questions for Mr. Fulton? Thank you very much for your time. And we'll move now to the applicant, Mr. <coughs> Jerry Kadu, who is with us. Um, can we move the slide? Thank you very much, Lewis. And Mr. Kadu, are you with us? Yes, indeed. I'm here. Thank you. Hello. And you, you also know the procedure by now? I do, <laughs> indeed. You have three, my three minutes. minutes. We can hear you. We can see you. Um, and you're three minutes um, ready now. Thank you. Good morning, all. Thank you for allowing me to address the committee once again. The application in front of you today is for the erection of a chalet bungalow with garage and associated infrastructure. The main reason for submitting this application was to address concerns raised by the parish council on the previously approved application for a single bungalow on this site. The proposed dwelling mirrors the recently constructed dwelling to the west known as AMS, a property which we constructed and sold to Daniel Fulton and his partner, Brian Cameron, in 2018. If Mr. Fulton is so concerned about highway safety, why did he purchase the property? Uh, the proposed dwelling has the same roof pitch and ridge height as the Elms and a ridge height lower than the approved dwellings, plots four and five to the south. We attended the Parish Council meeting on the 8th of February, 2021, at which the Parish Council considered this application and gave it an overwhelming vote of support. We now understand that after a period of some six months and probable intervention from a third party, they wish to remove their support. This is exactly the same application that was submitted back in December last year. Nothing has changed except the Parish Council's recommendation from one of support to one of objection. Some would suggest the Parish Council is not here today to represent the two and a half thousand plus um, residents. I think, Mr. Kadu, we, we just have to be very careful in terms of making references. I know this is a very difficult thing, but um, mm. yeah, just, but just it, continue. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so the Create Highways report that's referred to in the agenda pack was commissioned and paid for by Fuseland Consortium and allegedly only approved by Mr. Fulton after the fourth draft. The response from the local highways authority clearly shows this report is not worth the papers written on. Mr. Fulton should be asking for his money back instead of applying to the planning inspector to recover those costs from the LPA or indeed the highways authority. We have noted the various objections raised. We're led to believe with the exception of objections from the Paris Council and Fuseland Consortium, most of the other objectors, very few of which are long-standing residents, have raised objections in response to Mr. Fulton's campaign on social media, designed to cause alarm by spreading misinformation about the proposal. Mr. Fulton's campaign against the LPA has been running for three years now, 
and is built on foundations of misinformation, lies and deceit, and the cracks are now beginning to show. His last three applications for judicial review have been refused by the High Court. Uh, yeah. Mr. Cadu, I think we, we you, I think we can't have um, slanderous comments, which are. In I don't think it's slanderous. I think it's factual. So anyway, yeah. I, I'll finish then. I would just like to ask the committee to support this application. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think you know, um, from both, we we had um, aspersions about the professionalism <coughs> and the evidence on which. Um, both from Mr. Fulton and Mr. Cadu, I can understand that emotions are very, very high over over this case, but we, we have to be very, very careful. And it's often this is why we're here to try and address these kind of um, issues. So um, we now go to thank you very much, for Mr. Cadu. For, oh, sorry. But any questions? Sorry. I wonder if Mr. Cadu is, I don't think he's, he can confirm it. Are you either a lawyer or a planning consultant? And would you like to retract the statements that you've just made, which are um, uh, really out of order? I, I didn't quite understand. The one question was about, did you hire a planning consultant? Is Mr. Cadu a lawyer or a planning consultant himself? And some of the statements that he's just made, um, is he now going to retract them? Well, I didn't ask Mr. Fulton if he was a lawyer. We haven't asked him if he's a lawyer or planning consultant. Fulton made the sort of statements that we've just been hearing, um, which are very much that um, the views are wrong. Um, <coughs> and and I, I would just like some clarification. How, 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 um, how qualified is he to make these statements? So I think what I would like to do as chair is both of the speakers today, and we can understand that the emotions are raised, but I also heard from Mr. Fulton um, um, aspersions that the statutory consultee has no evidence. And I would just prefer everybody that comes to committee that doesn't have to have these kind of, gets to the situation where they are making these, these allegations. I understand that emotions are very, very high. Um, and they could feel this and perceive this, but this isn't the place for them to assert that on both sides. So if you if you accept that, Councillor Deborah, thank you, thank you very much. So if we thank you very much, Mr. Cadu, for your thank you. presentation. Um, and we move now to the parish council, and we have Councillor Daniel de la Mer Lyon with us. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, and I hope we're not going to go into similar grounds. Thank you very much. And would you just um, confirm with us that you have the authority of the parish council to speak? I do, yes, and I will try and keep it very short to keep you on track. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, good morning, everybody. I hope you all received the written version of what we would have presented at the last meeting with the contextual information and all the documentation. I'd like to thank Councillor Roberts for her reply and acknowledging uh, the, the content. I don't want to dwell on the procedural issues that we highlighted, uh, but I will touch briefly on that in just a second. Um, I think, you know, both the applicant and uh, Mr. Fulton know the views of the Parish Council well. Our views on this have always been one of, around highway safety. Uh, speaking in, in my, one of my additional capacities as the uh, organiser and orchestrator of the Community Speedwatch Initiative for the Parish Council, in fact, that's what brought me into the Parish Council, I can speak from personal experience of the volumes of traffic at that specific location. As we highlighted, we have two approved locations very nearby. It has always been a concern. Uh, it's also very in close proximity to a bus stop where uh, the local colleges pick up, which causes large gatherings of uh, children on the pavement, which have further obscures the view. So our view on highway safety is underpinned thoroughly. And I hope that from the documents that we shared with you previously, uh, you have a very clear view. Uh, I'd like to thank Lewis for correcting the statements and just to address Mr. Cadu's uh, observation uh, which is a little bit disappointing, as I believe he was at the meeting where we changed our view from support to uh, reject or to do not support. That was purely on the grounds of the information as presented to the planning inspectorate, not representing our views or comments correctly and not including any of our feedback. So I hope that makes that clear. Uh, I'll happily take any questions that anyone may have on our previous submission after the last meeting 
or anything I've said today. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions, please? Councillor Deborah. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning. Um, can you just confirm to me, was that uh, a unanimous um, decision of your um, councillors um, uh, that um, they were now um, rejecting the application? From memory, councillor, it was, yes, but unfortunately I am doing that from memory. And I would like to, just to understand, so the, um, and I've been in planning committees of our parish council where this has happened. Um, the objection, can you just remind us what the objection, the reason for the objection? It was because at that time the planning inspector had an allowed an appeal um, and you felt that they had not included the parish council's concern. So the original position, as Mr. Cadu suggests, was indeed support, but it was support with observations around highway safety. Uh, when the summary information for the planning inspector was presented, it was presented as a clear support with no mention of our additional concerns, as it appeared that they had not been provided any of the documentation which we had, we had submitted, be it submissions to this forum or uh, otherwise, um, we decided uh, to re remove our support and make a very clear statement that we felt procedurally we, we, were, we were not welcome and our input was not, uh, was not valued in the situation, as you'll note from the tone and the content of the complaint that we raised. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Deborah Oates. Very quick secondary. Can you just inform me, um, are you going to be putting in representation yourselves, the Parish Council, um, at the planning appeal? Thank you. I believe that we probably will, yes. However, I'm not sure what additional material we could provide over and above what we have already provided. Thank you very much, and thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Um, we now move to debate. And I'm opening the debate and any questions that you have um, or comments for debate members. Councillor Deborah Roberts. Councillor Deborah Roberts. Thank you, Chairman. In for a penny, in for a pound. Um, at the, the last meeting, um, I think quite a few of us, well, certainly, um, I think from this side, um, we were concerned the fact that um, at the very last minute, I think it was the night before, it suddenly appeared on the horizon that the County Council were going to take down um, quite long lengths of the hedge, um, presumably because otherwise uh, it was um, dangerous, um, this access. And um, I think it was, I'm sorry, I don't believe in coincidences. I think it was, um, rather blatant that uh, it was being done quite so uh, hurriedly and without seemingly without consultation. So if Mr. Finney is around, I would like to ask him how that came to be um, so suddenly and within hours of us having to make a decision, something like that was happening. Um, also, I mean, it's really, it seems to me, it's very much down to, you know, not the building itself, not the, the, um, the scope of that, what we're down to is, as the parish council have just um, pointed out, we're down to, is this a safe access or not? And is it going to be dangerous? Um, and that, I think, will be the guiding principle, I would have thought, of the planning appeal. Um, but I would like to know, again, from Mr. Finney, um, various uh, maps and drawings and layouts um, have um, appeared, obviously, on the paperwork. And I'm not quite sure. Uh, I, accurate they are and how compliant with each other they are. And I'd like to know from Mr. Finney, Dr. Um, John, sorry, Dr. Dr. John Finney, thank you, Chairman, Dr. Finney, um, if the county council can be absolutely sure um, that, or should I say, are the plans really basically only indicative um, and therefore should not be relied upon um, for legal purposes? Uh, because I think, you know, one of the things that I was very concerned about at that last meeting before it was adjourned was um, that we were being 
expected to make a serious decision, which would be going as part of our exercise to an appeal, actually rather in the dark. And um, um, Mr. Reid and I somewhat clashed swords um, because I was very unhappy that we were going to go into something that would be legal and understanding, um, and we didn't know what actually also our legal advice um, had been. Now, I did actually say at that meeting that I was going to ask for that information. Um, following that, we actually went away, so I've been out of district, um, but the officers can be assured I shall be asking um, for that information, um, albeit that it will be privileged information, I'm sure. But so those are the questions that I would like to ask Mr. Finney. How comes all that um, sudden maneuver about the hedges, and, and quite honestly, how can the county council be taking hedges down that maybe don't belong to them um, without getting themselves into a bit of bother? And I would like to know, um, do you, does the county council believe it can rely on the maps, the, uh, are, are they indicative or are they actually definite that they could be relied on for legal purposes? Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Um, are you with us, Dr. Finney? I am, Chair. So, yep, three questions that I see. Um, one, can you just explain the work on the hedges that went in our Bay County hedges? Um, two, can you confirm, as in the report, that you consider that there are no severe um, impact, significant impacts on safety, and three, can of the highway access, and three, um, about whether or not you can rely on indicative, are these indicative plans, and can you rely on them for legal purposes? Okay. First thing first, the relationship to the hedge. Um, my comments were that the Highway Authority have powers under Section 154 of the Highways Act 1980 to trim back vegetation, which includes hedges, which encroaches over the adopted public highway, specifically to allow visibility between vehicles. Now, we normally in this process would ask the owner to do so first. If they fail to do so, we do have powers to undertake that work at their cost. It's not something we do normally. We say we normally ask them to undertake those works first, and most people are quite happy to do so. Um, so there is no intention on the highway authority's side of going in heavy handedly we will ask for the hedge to be trimmed back if it is required to provide appropriate inter-vehicle visibility displays. We don't own the hedge. We don't own the highway. It is land over which we have control. And if the hedge is encroaching over that land, we do have powers to request the removal of the vegetation. So, as I say, we, as I say, we don't own that and we don't own the hedge. In terms of the extent of the adopted public highway, the maps as provided are sufficient for the highway authority to carry out its duties as required under the Highways Act 1980 and or as a consultee for the planning authority. They are actually based on a series of documents. Um, one of, I'll give you a very quick list, if I may. The enclosure awards, which are 18th and 19th century documents of the, the regularization of common land, land, land Sorry, I'm finding it a little bit difficult to. Uh, for an intonation, we shouldn't be closing them. Do, do we know what the works are? It's, um, for anybody who's listening on live stream, we've got some kind of works going on in the building. Sorry, um, Dr. Finney. Um, no at all. Oh, well, they're, they're important. <laughs> okay, let's just. Sorry, if you could just repeat that. Sorry? Of course, yeah. No, no problem. We, we have, there are a series of, series of evidence one of which is the closure awards, which is the consolidation of land held in common to private ownership. Um, what that demonstrates is the areas that aren't in common ownership or in private ownership, and they're mostly the roads, so that's the extent of the highway. They date from the late 18th, early 19th centuries. We rely on the 1910 Finance Act maps, which again show where private land ownership is, therefore land outside that, where it's so to be a road, etc., is likely to be adopted public highway. We have a list of streets which we are required to maintain under section 36.6 of the Highways Act 1980. We have the Roads and Bridges Committee records dating from 1899 to 1977 where roads are adopted by resolution of committee. 
we rely on our Section 40 plans from 1959 Highways Act and our Section 38 plans for 1980s Highways Act. But probably the most important document we rely on is the 1929 handover maps when the Rural District Councils handed over responsibility for highways to the then County Council under the 1929 Local Government Act. Those plans are at a scale of 25, inch, 25 inches to the mile, as it was then obviously, and they actually do show the coloured extent of the adopted public highway. So we're not reliant on a series of ordnance survey maps. Accuracy within urban development is reasonably good. We are reliant on a whole series of evidences, and that's not the full extent, but that's our primary evidence base. So we, we, we are, and I say, I am confident that the plan as provided is suitable for the highway authority to carry out its duties. In relationship to highway safety, as many of the councillors in this committee will have heard before, I have often said you cannot make the highway safe. It is the risk-filled environment. The question as highway officers we have to ask is, is the range of risks and hazards associated with the development within that that the people using the highway would expect to encounter? Given the low level of impact of this development, and it must be remembered that this already has planning permission on this site for a dwelling. So from the highway authority's perspective, there is no increase in motor vehicular movement for this application from a three bedroom house to a four bedroom house. There is no significant increase in risk and hazard. There is clearly an increase in risk and hazard, but it is not significant and certainly would not comply with the requirements of the National Planning Policy Framework. I trust that answers Councillor Roberts's questions. Thank you very much, Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Chair. I don't want to be pedantic, but I wonder if, I wonder if uh, Dr. Finney could just uh, clarify for me, because I understand that um, it, what it was talking about was a removal of the hedge, quite a substantial, re and I understand that the word was removal, <coughs> but Dr. Finney is now saying cut back. Um, what is the intention? Is it to take down the hedge? i.e. remove it completely, or just cut it back a little bit. I mean, I know that the County Council have those powers about cutting back hedges. However, I do have to say that in my own patch, there has been so numerous Councilor occasions... Deborah, Rob, can we keep to this case? We've got enough in this case. Where please. it doesn't Councilor actually Deborah, Rob, ever happen. Can we keep it in this case? And we've got enough to deal with on this one, I think. So, and I also want to know how relevant this is to the case. We're asking whether or not action that has happened um, was removal or cutback, I think is your question. Uh, the, the, the answer to the question, as far as I can ascertain, the hedge is not planted within the adopted public highway, it is overhanging the adopted public highway, so it will be trimming back, not removal. Thank you. And we have Councillor Dr Richard Williams, please. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I'd like to stick with, with Dr Finney, if I can. And I'd like to ask a question, which is on a similar line to Councillor Roberts. So I'd like to ask a question about the map that appears on page 27 of our supplement or bundle. So it, it's that one, just so everyone can see. Um, now on that map, Fuse Lane appears to come at the highway at an angle. There's quite a noticeable angle there. And if you sort of turn back, you can sort of see that angle on page 25, but you can see it a little bit more prominently in the map on page 23. But there is no such angle on the maps we were shown by the planning officer at the start, where he showed a sort of continuous straight line where Fuse Lane abuts the highway. Um, and having visited the site, which I did do before the um, 8th of September planning meeting, that is not um, what I saw, any indication that Fuse Lane somehow jutted out into the middle of the pavement. Um, so I'm not really clear about the accuracy of, of what we're being shown on, on page 27, given that the, as I say, this, this angle that suddenly seems to have appeared seems completely at odds with what I saw on the ground and is at odds with the pictures that the planning officer showed and indeed the map that the planning officer showed 
Um, so I, I, I would be grateful for some clarification, really, about where this odd sort of angle and, has and come from. And the concern is because... Because we're not relying on accurate drawings, because I think this drawing on page 27 is supposedly showing us, I think, that visibility um, is, is, is possible, visibility space is possible, but, but I don't... That is not my experience of that lane, having visited it. It does not look like that, and therefore the question is how uh, much reliance can we actually place based on that map. And then an another quick one, um, just for Dr. Finney as I'm on it. On page 29, we have another diagram, figure 3.3. Um, now, is that diagram applicable only to a direct access? Because I'm sure I've seen this diagram before when we've been looking at planning applications, and that looks like a diagram that is just simply for a direct access off the highway to a dwelling, uh, not what we've got here, which is an access to, to a lane where there are a number of houses. Um, so I'd just be grateful for some clarification as to what that figure 3.3 diagram actually refers to. Does it refer directly to a situation like we have on, on Fuse Lane? Thank you very much. Dr. Finney. Okay. Um, in relationship to the cartographic representation of Fuse Lane, um, the reality is that according to our records on the public rights of way, Fuse Lane at that point is two metres wide. If you take the centre line of Fuse Lane at two metres wide and measure a long carriageway edge, two metres by two metres, as shown in diagram 3.3, you can achieve appropriate pedestrian visibility displays. So while there may be slight cartographic differences between the Ordnance Survey and what is now on the ground, it's obviously sometimes difficult to know when the Ordnance Survey map those areas, things do change. There is no issue in achieving appropriate pedestrian visibility displays. Now, very briefly, um, Fuse Lane Consortium mentioned that we have changed our um, standards in relationship to pedestrian visibility displays. That is because the guidance has changed. Um, Manual for Streets, published in 2007, has no guidance on pedestrian visibility displays from accesses. The only published guidance at the moment is from Design Manual for Roads and Bridges, published in 2020. We are reliant slightly upon that as Dr. Councillor Williams has right, rightly pointed out that it is for direct access, but it is the only nationally published um, guidance we have for pedestrian displays. If we were to take manual for streets, we would not require them at all. Can you just repeat that last sentence? I didn't understand that last it, sentence. It's man manual for streets, volumes one and two, make no reference to pedestrian visibility displays. So according to that guidance, there appears to be no requirement for the same. As highway officers, we prefer to have some pedestrian visibility displays. And as I say, figure 3.3 is the only nationally published guidance available. And it complies with our guidance, which we published in May of this year, where we asked for two by two displays. These are two by two displays. So they, they will achieve what nationally is being sought. Okay, thank you very much. Can I just come back for a quick supplementary check? Okay, so just so I get this clear, um, you are agreeing that there could be some differences between what we see on page 27 and what's actually on the ground, because I must say, look, it's completely different having, I did, deliberately drove up that lane and I turned around and I came back out of it, yeah. um, and that is not what it looked like, and I did have real concerns about the visibility, actually, you couldn't really see until the bonnet of your car, and I've got a pretty small car, was basically halfway across the pavement. You really, you really couldn't see anything, um, and um, it was it was because of the hedge, which looks like it's on it's on private land. But anyway, the key point is, can I just have a clarification that you you, you accept that what we've got on page twenty seven might actually be different from what's on the ground, because you yeah, can't I mean, entirely I, rely yes, on the, I, the map. Yes, I I can't I can't deny that there are there are occasional differences between the cartographic representation of the ordnance survey and what then appears on the ground in the future. So the date of the map, I am not sure of. But it may have, there may be slight changes of angle, etc. I am not going to disagree with you. But as I said, it doesn't impact on the ability to provide those pedestrian displays, and that's the important in, in, as far as we are concerned. Thank you very much, um, Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> I think some of my office may, um, my questions may be for Dr. Finney, and some may be for our, our own officers. And it's, I'm afraid, it is on, on visibility. So in relation to the hedge, you have 
powers to the overhanging, from what I can gather, um, so you could cut back. However, height is actually quite a, a key thing on visibility, for the height of hedges. So is there any powers that, that mean you could actually bring the height of the hedge down so you could see over, top, over the top, perhaps, of the hedge, um, as opposed to just overhanging onto the, to the footway? And then for offices, um, clarification around, obviously, we'd have to take into consideration biodiversity and, and lots of other environmental issues when assessing applications. And because this is could be something that the county would potentially do as part of their powers and not directly to the application, although it's probably because we're building house down there, do we need to take into consideration any loss of vegetation and things there in our in our deliberations, or do we have to treat this as sort of almost two completely separate things? Um, hoping you you found the questions in there, Chair. Shall I respond first, Councillor? Yes, yeah. Uh, in terms of Section One Five Four, we have powers to uh, remove. Now, there is no stipulation as to whether that is trimming back or lowering. Anything. Therefore, we can make a decision on site as the highway authority. Um, you're quite right, Councillor Williams. It is usually we go for a 600 millimetre height, um, that being apparently the height of an unaccompanied child. Though who actually made those measurements, I have no idea. Um, in uh, Lewis, could you be so kind as to share Plan Four for me, please? I've provided Lewis with a series of drawings. All these are in the public domain. It's just easier for me to say Plan One. Um, that's the one. This shows the maximum extent of any any remove any trimming back that would be required. As you can see, over the 43 meters of the intervehicle visibility display, it is very relatively small, small areas, and therefore we are not talking about removing the entire hedge by any stretch of the imagination. So again, in fact, possibly to the north, I suspect there will be no requirement whatsoever, because in fact, mostly appears to be herbaceous vegetation. So just to put that into context, yes, we could ask for it to be reduced in height. You're quite correct. That would be a judgment call on site. Uh, and that would be a matter really for the local highway officer to make that decision rather than my, well, I would not make that decision. Thank you, Lewis. It's very kind. I'm, I'm afraid. Oh, that wasn't her question, no. Councillor Williams. God, I, I misunderstood it then. If I can clarify, Chair. Um, so my question was: As members, mm. are we taking into consideration the potential loss of vegetation in relation oh, to the you. application, okay. or is that as a second, you know, completely separate thing? Um, but what I want to the um, the there is actually now a supplementary to that about the height that if as members we felt that the highway safety was was a real concern we wanted that hedge lowered is that something we could condition or if we were determining potential condition or is that something that would not be not be allowed or found reasonable I should say rather than not being allowed Yes, can I, could I perhaps ask us for Philly before we ask that question, whether about, you know, are there cases where 600 metres you've gone below because, you know, on site you've seen that it's, you know, advisable? Um, the, the, the simple answer to your question, Councillor Williams and Councillor Haylings, is from a highway authority's perspective, highway safety is paramount. And we, we have powers to remove, as I said, and cut back hedges and vegetation. We are clearly cognizant of environmental implications of doing so and do so it, it, the least that we possibly can. Now, if it was a, I can't imagine a situation where perhaps well, it might be a very important hedge or it might be an ancient hedge, we would probably seek advice from our local, from our tree officer or from the district authorities tree officers to see what can and cannot be done. Again, um, you can lay hedges which is, of course, is a traditional way of, of maintaining them, which looks quite stark initially, but then actually makes the hedge better. It's, it's not something I can answer directly without a specific case, but I will say that I said highway safety is our paramount concern. And therefore, if it is, it is required to be removed, we have powers to do so. And we would do so regretfully, but we would, we would carry that out. 
question around whether or not you condition something to take it lower, but that would all be determined on the site itself. So I think that was your question, is, is that something that you would you know, consider in the condition? Well, who do I ask you for the first question? Uh, Chair, a um, couple of points. So I think the potential trimming or loss of a hedge is capable of being a material planning consideration, so the committee can consider that. With regard to the, uh, potentially conditioning a reduction in the height of the hedge, my question would be whether or not that hedge is within the control of the applicant or whether it's on third party land and actually whether or not such a condition would be reasonable if, the, if it's not in the control of the applicant, could it, could it actually be delivered? I suppose would be the question and mm -hmm. I don't know the answer in this case as to whether or not that hedge is in the control of the applicant or, or third party control. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Dr. Martin Khan. Uh, looking at the high, uh, Cambridge County Council Highways website, uh, in fact, a couple of days ago, for another matter, I came across uh, a provision that you have where volunteers can uh, take, uh, maintain highway uh, on, with, with permission of the highway authority, um, including trimming back hedgerow, uh, uh, hedgerows and ba uh, boundary vegetation where, where it's obstructed. Um, has any application been made to trim the highway, uh, have permission to do that on a voluntary basis there? Um, and if and would you give permission were it de demanded? Um, because it strikes me as an, a relevant consideration is whether the local uh, residents affected have already asked to be able to trim back the, uh, the vegetation. It gives an indication of how serious the problem is. As far as I'm aware, Councillor, no um, application for trimming back has been made. As I stated earlier, if if a member of the public raises this as a particular problem that would include obviously the residents of Fuse Lane. Our initial response is always to write to the owner and ask them to trim back their hedge in the, in, in the first instance. Um, in terms of voluntary, voluntary organisations are taking those works, if the county council's highway authority is content with that, then I see no reason why they shouldn't do so. Thank you very much. We have no further Comments or questions? Nick? So if, if we don't, yeah. I assume we're going to the debate now, Chair. Well, we are, we are in the debate. Well, yeah. we have questions, I'm assuming. Um, so I find this very, so we actually, I think one of the first things as, as a new committee in 2018, we visited the site. So we meant most of us have had a site visit. Um, and my my concerns around the Fuse Lane was very much, um, actually, if you're walking across the, the front as a pedestrian, you can, you can look round and you can, see, you can hear or see a car coming. What's very, very difficult is the, the bonnet of your car as it's coming out and um, to be able to see it, which is why I've asked the questions about if we could cut down the sort of 60 centimetres, cut the hedges down, because then at least you'd be able to see over the top. And I think that would have a, a very different impact on, on the highway safety. Um, and I appreciate it is a balance as well because it's, you know, the additional the additional house and, and, and everything else. Um, and there's already like a fallback position of a three bed rather than four bed. But I do think that even though it's going up, it might only seem as a bedroom that we, in practical terms, we know that's, that's another car um, quite often. Um, and it's, it's very difficult. I think, I, I hear what our advice is that we can't condition um, for the, because it's not in the control of the applicant. Um, but um, I'm, I am concerned about the slays and the, and the visibility. Uh, I, I, I wish there was a way that we could condition it or if there was a way of finding out if it was possible or agreeable to the local residents to, to lower because actually I think that would be a benefit all around. But without getting that reassurance um, and without knowing if that's possible, I, I do feel that um, I do feel that the visibility is, is too poor to put any any further pressure on it than than currently there is. Thank you, Chair. Good stuff. Thank you, Chair. Just in response to that point, and perhaps Dr. Finney can confirm. Um, the, the local highway authority, I think we already have confirmed, but the local highway authority does have control over those relevant areas of hedge and could, 
provide that trimming back if it was required. That, is that what you're saying, Dr. Finney? Yes, the, the, as far as the highway authority is concerned, the hedge is going over the adopted public highway, which is part of the grass verge, and if required or if requested under, as I say, under section 154 of the Highways Act, we have powers to trim back. So in answer to Councillor Williams' question, yes, we can reduce the hedge in height or we can trim the hedge back to the required visibility display. But so as, as I said, we would normally ask the resident to do that first out of courtesy and also Perfectly honest with you, many many people don't realise they're over, overhanging the highway, and once you point it out, they are more than happy to trim their hedges back. Again, it's done at the appropriate time of year, so it doesn't impact on pl um, bird plant nesting birds, etc. Does that answer the question? Thank you, Captain Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, it, that was more of a statement than, than a question. I understand. I, I do understand that there are powers. However. In, in granting permission, we have no reliance that or any way to secure that that power would be used. And I think like many things in planning and, and what have you, it, it's subjected to the person. And so while for myself, that is a real concern, for somebody else, they may take, may take a different judgment, which is their prerogative, but without actually being completely 100% guaranteed that that hedge can go down, which, which we can't have. We, we know it's possible, but doesn't, we don't know it will be done. So that's, that's just it for myself. And this is just to remind the, the um, applicant, unfortunately, you, know, you had your three minutes speaking, so this is now the debate for planning committee members. So you're, you're not able to do the response. Councillor Deborah Wood. Thank you again, Chairman. Um, well, the thing is, of course, as well, is that hedges regrow. They regrow very quickly. And once you start hacking at them, they tend to grow even more um, quickly and strongly than they, they were previously. And I don't honestly believe for a moment that the county council um, is going to go around continually cutting this hedge back. Um, certainly, in, in my patch, the problem hedges aren't cut back, when we, even though we tell them about them. They never do anything, never even send them a letter. It's left to the parish councils. Um, and I, I'm afraid that this has become a bit of a David and Goliath fight, hasn't it? And it's all become, in my opinion, far too personal. And, and as you quite rightly pointed out, Chairman, I think emotions are running high um, on both sides. And I think we've allowed ourselves and our authority to get tied up in that as well. I, I think the very fact that, you know, so much information has been ploughed out to us that, you know, for the most of us, we are not lawyers. Uh, we have some of that. Thank God. Um, but the majority of us aren't. But at the end of the day, I think that this is going to be very much decided quite clearly by the um, arguments that are put forward um, at the appeal. And the I'm going to dismiss in my mind the, the two sides, the two personal sides that are fighting about it. And I'm going to concentrate on the parish council now. I don't believe for a moment that the parish council is emotionally involved in here. I think that they're taking a pragmatic and sensible approach to it. Um, and, uh, and they are very much focusing not on whether the building should be built or, or what, but what the effect um, highways uh, wise. Now, these are the people who we all know, many of us are members of parish councils, and we do know that our parish councils um, do know their own wards and their own roads very, uh, and have very clear understandings of the problem ones. And here we have the parish council stating that it cannot support this on highway safety. Um, and that to me is pretty damning and pretty critical. Um, I think Dr. Finney um, answers to Dr. Williams uh, here actually indicate that we cannot particularly guarantee that the, um, the maps and the drawings and the uh, designs um, actually will stand up to um, a great deal of critical co uh, uh, consideration at the appeal. Um, and so I go back to uh, the fact that yes, I, I have been on that site I've walked along that site. I know what that site is like going into it and going out of it. I think I've actually been to that site on more than one occasion. 
Um, and that is one thing that does always strike you. Now, um, if we are making a decision based upon um, uh, the clarity and the stand-up of the evidence, I have got feelings that it won't stand up and that we will lose. Um, and I'm very sorry that it has come to all this because I think that um, taking Thank you. Can you taking an, a, an untoward attitude about it hasn't helped us either, but I won't be supporting this. So. Yeah, thank you. Councillor Julius Ripley. Unlike um, Councillor Roberts, I will be supporting this because I've come to a judgment. Um, I think the evidence in front of us does support the four bedroom property as opposed to the three bedroom and is the balance. And for me, that balance is okay and I'm happy with it. Councillor Dr. Tim Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I think I, I heard the parish council earlier on um, and what they did say was that they had supported but with some concern about highway safety. And they only changed um, that recommendation because they hadn't seen that we had put in, in our response to the inspector, their specific uh, concerns, um, which is a shame, but you know, um, we can improve on that, obviously learn lessons. Um, but they didn't say categorically that they didn't um, support it in the first instance. Um, I think we're all hearing, we're hearing things we want to from what people have said, but we need to be very careful um, to make sure that we understand what is being said. Now, that is what I thought I heard. Um, the concern, obviously, on highway safety is, um, is important. We have already um, uh, a decision to grant um, outline that appeal. So I would imagine that the inspector had actually considered all this. And as uh, Dr. Finney said, the, uh, the increase from three to four bedroom in, I guess, highway terms is marginal. And there doesn't seem to be um, any reason why the safety is any more compromised uh, with a three or a four bedroom house. Now, I think, as has been said, we have to strike a balance. Highways, as we've heard, have powers that they can use, and no doubt they will use if and when they have to. We can't condition um, anything that is outside of uh, the applicant's ownership. And I have to rely on the evidence of the professionals who is the highways authority in this case. And if they're willing to put their, um, put their, uh, I guess, their, themselves behind this, and they have recommended that we can um, go ahead with approving this, I am minded to support. Thank you. Councillor Dr. Richard Williams. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I won't take up the committee's time by speaking um, at great length because I agree in large part with the comments that um, Councillor Roberts made. Um, I will just say, uh, and this is understandable how this has happened, that it's not to question anyone's professional judgment or integrity, but the difference between these maps and what you see on the ground does concern me. I completely understand how something can be one way on a map and that gets sort of taken forward. Um, but, but, but I do worry here that we've ended up with something that, that, that is really at odds with, with, with what you can see on the ground. Um, and that is a concern for me, um, coupled with what the parish council have said, with, with which back that up. Um, I am minded to vote against this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Dr. Martin Khan. <coughs> uh, I... <laughs> When this original, uh, if the site had been as it was when uh, it was only the retreat and the willows on the lane, and uh, we were given the application, uh, then I think there might be a case we'd be considering the highways in fact, cases on this road. Uh, 
However, we now have all you are talking about here is a, 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 an increase of one bedroom on one house. Um, so the, the inference is de minimal. And then I come back to the situation is, is the situation currently available, uh, uh, serious? We come back to the fact that no member of the uh, people living on the lane has asked permission to trim back the hedges from the high rise authority, which they, are, they can do, there's a provision and a scheme for voluntary people doing it. So, which suggests that they don't consider it sufficiently serious a problem that they want to take action themselves. Because we do know that highways authorities is not always terribly efficient in keeping everything highly trimmed. I understand that problem. So, uh, the question now arises, now they know about it, uh, well, now that it's been put in the public, there is, a, there is a solution. We're told that if we trim back the hedge, there is adequate visibility. And there is a provision which they could do to maintain the hedge. So, I do not see a problem coming from the maintenance of the hedgerows. It could be done as a solution to that problem, which is available to the, uh, um, to the local, uh, to, to local residents, including the actual objector to this uh, application. So, I, I, I cannot see any grounds on which we could object to this uh, application, having had professional advice, which we have to take into account, um, that, it, that it is acceptable. Um, therefore, I will be supporting this application. Councillor Eileen Wilson. Hi, um, I be, thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Dr. Palm has eloquently said what I was going to say. That there is a remedy that's open to any of the objectors and even to the current residents if that visibility is seen to be not sufficient. Thank you. So I'll be supporting this application. Thank you. Um, I'm down next to speak. And I also want to refer to the, the, the parish council comments. And especially, um, I think we've had multiple occasions here where we've had representations from local people that they do consider, they're very concerned about the highway's safety, but we've had to consider in the end this, this, the level of significant impact that highways have then presented to us um, in their professional view as a statutory consultee. And we've had this conversation many times as to, but why aren't we hearing from highways that this is significant enough? So this isn't the only case we've had in front of us like this. Um, there have been many and local representation. So I do fully understand what was presented to us today by the parish council. I, as Councillor Dr. Tony Hawkins, had said would I would like um, for us to ensure that in what is presented to the appeal does include fully all of the parish council um, submissions and concerns, um, and hopefully that will be taken forward, specifically around the highways safety concerns that they have. Um, and, and it is good to hear that, um, especially um, that the representation that we had today from the parish council, is they already involved in speed watch initiatives, which are community speed watch initiatives. What I would hope is the community around this area comes together with the owners of those hedges and does work together with the applicant to work out what can happen around the safety, because this is now a village. This, this is an issue that needs to be, to need to be dealt with. For me, um, we have to go according to what the statutory consultee says. And this was um, refused on highway safety grounds. The inspector looked at it, he went and visited and said that it was allowed because they did not consider them. They, they, um, they, they conceded that there, there wasn't a significant impact on this. So for me, therefore, I feel that I must be leaning towards approving this um, on, those, on those grounds. Councillor Claire Donald. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, I, we've heard from Dr. Martin Kahn a very clear um, statement concerning the maintenance of the hedges. Um, and we've had very clear evidence from Dr. John Finney um, and on the basis of what we have here in the documentation, what we've heard this morning, I'll be supporting this application. I think we've heard from most people, so I'd like to move a motion that, um, that we, if we hear on any of the, the reasons for refusal. Yeah, that's good. Thank you, Chair, through you. Um, so, obviously, we've heard some members, I think, would be likely to vote uh, against the proposal. Um, and so just to clarify that that would be on the basis that the applicant um, has failed to demonstrate the existence of or ability to create safe vehicular access. And that would be contrary to um, the both the national planning policy framework 
and policy H16 of the South Cambridgeshire District Local Plan. So for those members voting against, that would be my summary, um, but just to check that through you, Chair. I think that, that yes, so that's what everyone's saying. Thank you very much. And um, if, Liz, could you put up onto the screen the, what was the recommendation? Because that was slightly updated from... appreciated. Um, it has been mentioned by a number of uh, councillors now about uh, the um, ability um, of um, residents to cut back uh, the hedge. Uh, I'm not sure in my, as though that's going to be a very important factor in um, the argument at appeal. Um, I would like to understand whether officers actually believe that a possibility of people cutting back their hedges will actually amount to, you know, very much um, at all in uh, an inspector's decision making. Material. Um, uh, we have the we have the inspector's report in front of us, which I read three times last night. To, to, and they talked about how they'd walked it, they'd driven it, they'd done it. So I think we've gonna, and then they've made what they think are their, their conclusions. It's, each, there are different inspectors, but um, I did read that, I thoroughly did, because we also have to seriously consider when we make the balance, that that's part of the evidence, that's material as well, what we have in front of us. So rather than considering whether that, what they might do, we know what they have done, and that's not often not the, the case for us. Uh, I am moving, I'm going to work for both. Yes, I'm going, to, I'm going to explain this. No, 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 no. That's what I want to do. Thank you. So I'm moving to now, if we look on page 30, if you have the agenda packed from the prior meeting, we have the officer's recommendation that the planning committee determines it would be minded to approve the application if it had the authority to do so. I'm now looking at the screen. Do so subject to the conditions and informative as set out on page 24 of the 8th of September 2021 officer report. I have it as page 30. So I'm, I'm going to go as page 30. So I'm going to take it exactly textually as it is on page 30, Lewis, not as it is on your screen there. Am I okay with that, Chris? Thank you very much. So it's, I'll read it again. Officers recommend that the planning committee determines it would be minded to approve the application if it had the authority to do so, subject to the following conditions and informative. Um, the officer has asked that we take both of these together. I would suggest that we take them separately. So I just want to vote on the first one. So that is what we are now voting on, is that first part of that. So if you would now please vote. So that has been approved with eight votes to three, no abstentions. Um, and obviously there is the question that there was, um, by Mr. Fulton, that there was no basis for the second part. So if I could have some clarification. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have checked with um, colleagues during the meeting. The planning inspector directed the cost um, application response to the district council, although the issue being raised in that cost claim, I understand, is to do with the comments of the highway authority. But the district council uh, does still need to respond to that claim. So um, officers would like the authority of the committee to respond to the claim. Thanks, Chair. So could you please put that back up on the screen again, Lewis? Oh, sorry, sorry. It wasn't your group this time. Yes, of course. Councillor Dr. Richard. And yeah, it's, it's, sorry, Chair, this is, this is quite confusing. I mean, Mr. Fulton is saying he hasn't made a cost application. I mean, he should know. Um, and, and that explanation seemed a bit odd. That yeah. The planning and the inspectorate referred something to us. I, I'm so not as sure I understand, what's going on here. So as I understand, it is the inspector that decides um, how the costs are going to be awarded. I am also not... A <laughs> Can I just say, during this whole meeting, we are being asked to be considered sort of legalities in many things. We're moving very far from sort of the, the balance of things. So I'm going to ask for confirmation. I don't really have anything further to add, Chair. The, the letter from the Planning Inspectorate um, is to the District Council um, notifying us of a, a, a claim for 
for an award of costs on the basis of the lack of evidence provided by the Highway Authority, the District Council will need to respond to that letter from the Planning Inspectors as part of the appeal process, and that's what we're seeking consent to do. I'm sorry, through me. Yeah, I would suggest you said that through the County me. Council, through you, Chair, I would suggest that that's the response of the Senate to the County Council. Um, I think that that is rather a flippant response. We have just asked and had to confirm from our senior delivery officer whether or not he can repeat and confirm that the inspectors decided that the costs would be a decision for the district council. I will not query that further. I will move to the vote on this one. Count Heather Williams. Chairman, I believe before we vote, we have to debate. Um, so yeah. I'm going to speak, if that's OK, yeah. Chair. Yeah. Um, and I don't believe that that's what was actually just referenced. I think there may have been a misunderstanding there. The suggestion was that the cost should, our response should be that the cost should go towards the county council. So the, what's been asked here um, is that we delegate the authority to yeah. make a response. Could, if, I, if I could just give my mm -hmm. comments to the debate on this section, Chair. Um, I think we need clarification as to what the... This is the first time, to my recollection, we're being asked about this. What is the normal standard practice? Because actually what matters to me is whatever happens, we are being fair and consistent. It, and it automatically doesn't fair, fair and consistent on the fact that planning committee has got this when it's something we don't already have. So can we please have the reasons why we're being asked for this, if it's normally or is this, is this the normal procedure? Mm -hmm. um, and what would, what would our officers advise really on this? How would, how would they normally deal with it? Because it's not something we normally deal Thank with. You. Thank you. And Councillor Peter Fain, before I come to you. Chair, sure, I second your proposal that we move directly to a vote on this matter. Thank you. Um, I do have Chris, if you want to do, did you want to make a response? Thank you, Chair. Um, in the normal course of business where a cost claim is submitted to the District Council, um, if it's a matter that's being dealt with by officers under delegated authority, we would provide a written response to that cost claim, rebutting that claim if we felt that was appropriate to do. That's what we're asking for authority to do here, is to rebut uh, a cost claim um, that's being made uh, in, in this application. The reasons within that cost claim, I understand, are to do with the advice of the Highway Authority, but the letter has been sent to the District Council, and so the District Council wishes to respond to that. So the question is, does this come to planning committee, uh, you know, is that something that's come to planning committee? If it's because we're, we're treating at the planning committee, that's why we're being asked to review the audit. Yes, that's right, Chair. So, thank you very much. I'm going to move to a vote on this second item, which is officers also request delegated authority to submit a response to the cost application submitted by Fuseladen Consortium, dated, oh, sorry. I'm still reading it. I, sorry. I know you're going to go, you've moved on to the vote, but I was just still reading that bit. That's okay. So, officers also request delegated authority to submit a response to the cost Officers also request, uh, I'm going to read it out. Officers also request delegated authority to submit a response to the costs application submitted by Fuse Lane Consortium dated the 23rd of September 2021 to the inspectorate for consideration on behalf of the council. And we do take uh, you know, any kind of cost award very, very seriously, obviously. So I'm going to move to the vote. It would be four if you um, accept and adopt that recommendation, please, members. Thank you. That has passed with seven votes to three. Oh. Having insisted, we moved to the vote. It's So that would be seven votes for, three against, and one abstention. Members, I said that we would break for 15 minutes at about 11.30. It's quarter to 12. We'll have a, a short break. Thank you very much. So it is now 11.43, so if we can be back in the chamber sitting, ready for 12, please.
Thank you and welcome back everybody um, to the South Cams District Council Planning Committee. After a short break, we are now back to agenda item six, um, and this is on pages 389 to 450 of the agenda pack. And I understand that um, Vice Chair Captain Bachelor will remove, as he mentioned during the Declaration of Interests, so he will be out for both agendas item yep. six and seven. Correct. Thank you very much. And I would ask um, that if somebody would second my motion that Councillor Peter Fain be act as vice chair. Yes, Thank you very much. And I assume that by affirmation that goes ahead. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, um, and we are now on page 389 of the printed agenda report pack. This is application S slash 1963 slash 15 slash condition G, land to north and south and immediate Linton. The proposal is the submission of details required by condition 10 of surface water drainage of planning commission um, S slash 1963 slash 15 slash outline. The applicant is Abbey Developments Limited. Our key material considerations are surface water drainage and flood risk. And the application is brought to the committee because of the referral from the Council's Director of Planning and Economic Development, Parish Council Objection, and the wider public interest. And the presenting officer is Michael Sexton. Michael, are you with us? Good afternoon, Chair. Yes, I'm here. Good afternoon. Yes, just. Yes, just. Yes, Michael, thank you very much. Do you have any updates and a summary of the application, please? Yes, thank you, Chair. I've got quite a few updates to go through. Um, the first update is just a brief update to the update report. Um, members were provided with a copy of the 3C Legal Services formal response to the pre-action protocol letter by email uh, yesterday, just before five o'clock, um, which is, is referenced in the update report. So I just wanted to, to raise that. Um, in terms of commencement of work on sites, uh, concerns were raised by Linton Parish Council with officers on Wednesday, the 22nd of September, that works have commenced on site. The council's enforcement team um, undertook a site visit on Friday, the 24th of September, and officers contacted the agents of the application uh, for a view from themselves and Abby um, as the developer as to whether works had commenced. Um, we received a response that did confirm that works uh, have commenced. That response was received by officers by email yesterday and aligns with the findings of the enforcement team. So officers can confirm that works have now started on the site and that the permission has been implemented. That has a slight impact on the discharge of conditions application that is before members um, now. The details of the application are still recommended for approval, but as the trigger for condition 10 states prior to the commencement of any development, a scheme for surface water drainage needs to be agreed, then lawfully the decision notice that the council would now issue if members were minded to support officers' recommendation and um, would state that the condition is accepted but not discharged rather than being discharged in full. So that has a slight update to paragraph 7 and 98 of the officer report, which refers to the condition being discharged. And um, just to clarify, because the trigger has, has now been um, breached, as it were, uh, we would simply agree the details rather than formally discharging the condition. Uh, members will also be aware of an email circulated from Linton Parish Council on the 28th of September at 20 past four, so yesterday, with an uh, attached letter and annotated drawings from the plans pack that support the committee items today. 
In response to the points raised in that letter, I, I can offer the following response for the benefit of members. Um, the plans do indeed have the same plan number, um, but they have been submitted to two separate applications. The plans are clear and readable as uploaded to the applications on the Council's website, but I appreciate the printing within the plans pack might not be as clear. The plans are identical in respect of road layout, siting of buildings, location of pipe work for drainage, etc. The plan submitted to support the surface water drainage discharge, discharge conditions application um, is in colour and highlights relevant areas of permeable paving and details applicable to the surface water drainage scheme and includes annotated boxes relevant to surface water drainage. The plan submitted to the foul water drainage section 73 application, which is the next item on the committee's agenda, greys out the details of surface water drainage as to only highlight those that are relevant to foul water drainage and provides further annotations in that respect. Um, there are some annotations that are consistent across both plans. For the purposes of the surface water drainage plan, which is drawing number E17-084-131 provision C7, which is referred to in the parish's letter, I can confirm that that plan has been published on the website, Council's website since the 1st of March 2021. Um, Linton Parish Council have been formally consulted on the application on the 1st of March 2021 and the 12th of May 2021 alongside all relevant and technical consultees, so that information has been readily available for comment. Uh, final update, um, I was made aware this morning that um, a letter from Lucy Fraser MP was sent to Liz Watts, the Chief Executive um, of South Cambridge District Council uh, this morning. Primarily, the content of that letter relates to the Horseheath Road development site, um, which is to the north of Bartlow Road Abbey Homes development. There is a short paragraph at the end of that letter that does refer to Bartlow Road, but uh, only insofar as matters that are, have already been provided in this update, the update report and the main officer report. So there's no new issues raised in that letter, but I just wanted to bring that to members' attention for clarity. So quite a lot, but that's, that's the updates. Um, I can move on to the presentation, Chair. We've just got a bit of a lip sync thing with you at the moment, but just at the very end. Yes, sorry, that is my internet and team sometimes does that and I've not been able to resolve it. So if I freeze and speak, that, that's the reason I can't do anything about that other than turn my camera off. So. Okay, no, that's, that's fine. Thank you. Okay. I think I've caught up with myself now. Uh, Chair, if you could confirm that the presentation is now visible on the screens. Yeah. Excellent. So, yes, this is uh, planning application S slash uh, 1963-15 condition G and relates to the uh, submission of details of condition 10 of the outline set, uh, consent, which relates to surface water drainage. Um, so for context, this is the site location plan. The site comprises two parcels of land, one to the north of Bartlow Road and one to the south and is located on the southeastern edge of the village of Linton. This is just from the context of the approved layout plan from the Reserve Matters application, which shows the arrangement of properties to the north and the southern parcel and associated areas of, of landscaping and landscape buffer. And this is condition 10 in full. Um, I don't intend to read it in full because it is in the, op in the officer report, but I did just want to highlight a couple of key sections. Um, the condition does require the details, uh, submitted details, to be in accordance with the flood risk assessment um, that form part of the outline consent, and for the scheme to include, take into account any subsequent changes in revised flood maps produced by the Environment Agency between the approval and implementation of the scheme. In that respect, the, this image is just an extract um, for notes from the flood risk assessment that supported the outline application. The document, um, in summary, uh, showed that the development will incorporate a sustainable drainage system that suits the site conditions. Uh, it considered the options of infiltration and restricted discharge, both illustrating the provision of an infiltration basin or lagoon here in the southern part of the layout. Um, the strategy would include either the use of infiltration techniques or reduce L restricted discharge into adjacent water course and the use of on-site attenuation. That's all covered in paragraphs 42 to 52 of my report. In respect of the updated drainage maps, um, the southern 
site drainage layout submitted in support of the application do include the latest Environment Agency flood maps, and that has been cross-referenced with the maps published on the Environment Agency's websites themselves. And again, that is confirmed in paragraphs 53 to 56 of the main report. And the application is supported by an array of plans, documents and calculations, which are set out as listed as approved plans at the end of the report. I only intend to show a couple um, for summary. This is the northern um, arrangement of the site, and it just illustrates that the northern part of the site will manage surface water from private areas by infiltration through individual plot circleways and permeable paving, while the northern site's access road will drain into a ring circleway, uh, which is highlighted in paragraph 58 of the report. And then this is a plan showing the southern um, layout and drainage arrangements with the Environment Agency flooding um, imposed over the top for reference. Um, this shows that the southern part of the site will be managed by permeable paving with a, a balancing pond um, with created storage and flow control, which will restrict surface water to 2.8 litres per second during and up to all events, including a 1 in 100 year storm event, plus a 40% allowance for climate change. Um, the condition actually only requires 30% climate change, so it's actually 10% better than what's required by the condition. Uh, surface water from the balancing pond will then pass through a filter trench with uh, gravel rifles to provide an, a final element of surface water treatment before outfalling uh, to the River Granta. Again, that's in paragraph 59 of my report. So in terms of key considerations, it is, it is obviously surface water drainage and flood risk. The application as amended is supported by an array of plans, documents and drainage calculations to demonstrate satisfactory scheme. The concerns of Linz Parish Council in relation to the scheme are noted and have been considered at all stages and shared with relevant technical consultees as assessment has been undertaken. Um, however, the Council specialist advisors and statutory consultees, specifically the Environment Agency and the Lead Local Flood Authority, consider the surface water drainage scheme to be acceptable and to provide a satisfactory method of surface water drainage and to prevent an increased risk of flooding. Officers therefore consider the details submitted as amended comply with the requirements of condition 10, uh, relevant national and local policy, and the condition should be agreed. Um, I've just left the uh, a slight update there. That obviously, we're not looking to formally discharge because of the, the now breach of the trigger um, because work's commenced on site. So we're looking to agree the details. And that's that's the end of the presentation, Chair. We'll now move to the public speakers, and we don't have um, either the applicant objectors, but we do have um, parish council um, here. And so I understand that we have Councillor Kate Kell and Councillor Enid Bold, who would help answer the questions. Hello, hello, all of you. It's lovely to see you like that. <laughs> 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 Thank you. We needed that today. That's very, that's lovely. Thank you very much. Um, and you also have Corrie Newell, who is there as a planning consultant to help answer the questions. So as I understand, Councillor Katie Kell, yes? Yes, Me. Katie. And you'll be the one who is speaking for the three minutes. It's going to be Enid. Yeah. Enid oh, Enid, you're to... going to be speaking for the third minutes. Right. Yes. Thank you. No, it's, it's wonderful. Um, and I have to ask that you have got authority from the Parish Council to... I certainly do. I'd also <laughs> like to ask a little bit of um, consideration. I'm working with one loan <laughs> at the moment, so a bit breathless. So don't, um, I might take, go over my three minutes, but the brain is still working, even if the loan is up. Went. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for making the effort. It's really, really important. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And so when in your own time, you let us know when you're ready to start. Yeah. Right. We're going. Um, our solicitors have served a pre-action protocol letter, uh, which pre pre goes before a judicial review, as you cannot lawfully approve conditions when the outlying consent has expired. The reserve matters application is out of time and permission for this development has lapsed. Condition 10 is at appeal and should not be determined here. Also, there's a moratorium 
on any development in Linton until a full drainage review has taken place. This is still underway, but we are aware that the Anglia water maps are inaccurate. It also recommends, <laughs> sorry, it recommends that you, this recommends that you approve a drawing which has two different schemes and at least one more that has not been consulted upon and is not on the website. We have only um, been able to be consulted on version 14 and not version 15, which is the one that Mr. Sexton referred to as one that we had consulted on and we haven't. Um, the scheme brings back many of the items which had previously been excluded. Um, and in order to get um, support from the statutory consultees. The previous objections included poor quality and design, inconsistent data and drawings, water flowing uphill, breaches of building regs, failure to comply with the parameter plan or reserve matters layout, landscaping objections, shared soakaways in gardens and loss of strategic tree buffer. There were ecology objections, there were pollution from the crates and breaches of the buffer zone for the river and its habitats. There were also steep roadways, high maintenance smart sponges and hydro brakes, which highways objected to. Excuse me a minute. <laughs> As as previously known flooding. We need the picture. Yes, we need some pictures, please. Sorry, we need the picture. Yes. Of the flooding. Yes, so, Chair, I do have material to present for the parish, so I can bring that up on screen. If they could Excellent. let me know when I need to move around, I'm happy to accommodate that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so Is that we the want, one? We want the, the one of the flooding. We want the one of the 1968 flooding. Please. That. No. No, this is sort of yeah. photograph. OK, sorry, this. That one. That, one. that one, that is the 1968 flooding. So we know that is where Noah's flood field flooded in 1968. The floods would cover half the houses on the southern side, the drains, pumping station, soakaways and drainage pond, causing river surge and pollution. The flood map of 68 and the photographs at the time show this. Um, in your pack, the Lead Local Flood Authority refers to river water in 2001 as the highest level ever recorded. However, they've only been recorded since 1981, and the EA has confirmed the water level was guessed at, as that was as high as the pumping as the monitoring station could measure. There are no pictures showing the extent of the flooding made public. Councillors have not had a chance to see the extent of the damage of the 20th of, of, the 20th of July. Sorry. Um, consultees appear to be working using different plans. Um, your, but the council's remit is larger than the consultees, and it is to protect the village against the risk of flooding. Development has now started on site despite outstanding pre compensation conditions. If there was still a live consent, this work would invalidate it. The works include new houses, accesses, services and drainage, which are critical to the development and go to the heart of the matter. We recommend you refuse to determine this while these issues are unresolved. When, not if, flooding occurs to this level again, the drainage scheme will be flooded with pollution in the centre of Linton and to the river, a rare chalk stream. If this application is not deferred to confirm legal standing, we recommend it be refused. It does not meet village needs. I think that's all I can manage. <laughs> no, thank you. And I have allowed you to go over the three minutes. So uh, thank, thank you, you very much for that. Um, thank you. Good. And do we have any questions? Councillor Dr. Timmy Hawkins. Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you. 
Um, first of all, Chair, if you're, if you're indulging me for saying this, won't have any impact on my on my deliberations, but um, thank you for the presentation. I know how much pain and everything else you're in right now, so can I just say complete um, complete awe at how you're still contributing to your community. Um, so uh, I was just wondering, you said about the deferral. Is it something that you could see that that there is potential resolution to have a, an application here that both both the community and the applicant could bring forward, or would a deferral lead probably to more objection um, rather than us just refusing it today? Do you think there is a resolution that could be made here? Thank you. It was actually conditioned that the developer should consult directly with the parish council on drainage schemes. They have never done this. And I think that if we did have proper consultation, using correct data, and we are well aware that a lot of the data used here by consultees, and especially by the developer, is entirely wrong. We have engineers. This is not the only engineer on board the parish council who have actually gone through all of the data with a fine tooth comb, and we are well aware of the discrepancies between the truth of the matter, the plans, and what is put forward in various outlines. And the remits. And the remits um, for the reserve matters and the outline. So I'm sure it could be resolved only if the developer and the consultees are provided with correct data and will listen to the parish council. Thank you. Thank you very much. Council Dr. Jimmy Hawkins. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. And thank you for all the effort that you've put into uh, these applications to, uh, to represent uh, the people of Linton. Um, I'm, I just wanted to ask you about, uh, I think it's paragraph 22 on page 397, um, where Um, I mean, it's talking about the southern part of the southern site experience for that flooding, and the applicant has provided photographic evidence to confirm that this flooding was confined to the environmental agency's modeled flood zones and did not extend to the part of the site proposed for development. I just wanted to ask you if that is your view, because you seem to be of the opinion that the LLFA maps don't represent what's happening on the ground. Like our, one, one of our um, parishion, one of our parish councillors who is an engineer to help us with this one, I can, please. I can definitely answer that. Our submissions have been completely misrepresented by the LLFA in the report. The reason for our photographs and for the very, very detailed information that was provided was to challenge the flood maps that are being used on this site. It's been misrepresented as being that is the extent of the flooding in a one in a hundred year event, and it, that is absolutely not what those um, details were trying to say. The details were saying that actually the line that is drawn at that one in a hundred year event currently floods at least twice a year. So the return period to that one in a hundred year event line is actually twice a year, not one in every hundred years. Um, hence the severity of what we believe to be very, very inaccurate flood maps. Thank you. I would also that. like to add that the, the current housing next door to it, Fincham's Coast, was built in about the seventies. At that time, it was built above that contour level, plus an extra metre of height, and because they were working on correct flood maps. Since then, their gardens have flooded several times. This is despite drainage, ditches, and all the rest of it. Their gardens have flooded. Their houses have not flooded. It's this extra one metre that stopped them from flooding. And that has never been taken into account with these current plans. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you for that. No further questions. Thank you. Um, and I'd also like to make a, a question as well. Um, and, you know, I feel this absolutely because I think flooding is one of the issues that we're going to have to be dealing with you know, from now, you know, and we should have been dealing with um, a lot. And the best way is when we can work together. And I do remember that on this very, you know, this, this very difficult application that we did insist after the site visit and having known of the experience and expertise that you have there, that there is this working together with the applicant. So it's, you know, it's um, concerning that, that that hasn't happened. But as I understand, can I just clarify, the, the pre-action protocol is, is about whether or not there has been an expiry of the application. Is that right? So it's about the expiry of the access part of the um, conditions. That's what the pre-action letter protocol is, is about, rather than about the flooding issues that we're dealing with right now. Is that right? Pre-action protocol, actually, um, it, well, it goes to the heart of the matter, doesn't it, Corrie? Um, we do believe, um, and the representation that you were all sent um, on Friday of last week from, uh, we, we sent you a copy of the solicitor's email, um, very clearly outlines why we believe that the planning consent uh, is no longer extant. It, it has expired. Um, and yes, that is the first um, part of our issue um, and with regards to bringing pre-action protocol. The second issue very much relates to the section 73, which is the second application. Corey, is there anything else that we need to add on that one? In terms of the response that we've had, I think it's worth saying that, that the response has actually not addressed the points made by Linton Parish Council's lawyers. Um, and particularly that section 13 is actually out of date. It refers to a previous um, a, a letter from, from LPC's lawyers. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Um, you want to comment on that now, Stephen Reid? Stephen Reid, the lawyer, our lawyer. Uh, thank you, Chair, if I may. Um, uh, Councillor Bald was asked the question whether she felt the matter was capable of being resolved and answered in the affirmative, as I understand it. Is, is that accepted? I think that if people took notice of the facts and the true calculations and all of the issues that lead into the flooding, we not only have river flooding, we have surface water flooding, we have water coming up through the gravel. We have a lot of issues regarding flooding. It's not simple. And although the parish council has tried to address some aspects, that was actually used against us in the outline. And I think, Stephen, you um, put into place a condition that helped us. But the only work the parish council has done was to restore floodplain. We have never done anything that would affect the site in question. And I know that misinformation was given even at outline. This is a very complicated matter. A parish council in itself cannot address it. And this planning application has completely ignored at least two of the reasons why we flood. The reasons for flooding need to be understood and they can the current layout does not address at least two of the reasons for flooding. Thank you. Councillor Ball, uh, 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 thank you for that. But, but the fact is that you did say that you felt matters were capable of resolution in relation to surface water. <sighs> can we, can we, can yeah, yeah, yes, yes. yes. What, what we are saying is that if you resolve the matters regarding surface water flooding, there are other implications which you have not yet taken into account, and that will include landscape, and it will include other issues to do with flooding. And we don't believe that the current layout 
could be consistent with the known flooding on the site. And the photograph, the photographs from 1968 and from 2001 show that you have development well within the area that floods. Thank you very much. Can I take a look? Yes. It, um, I believe that Mr. Reid may want to ask a, another question oh. of our parish council. But can I just say, I think it's my question that is being explored by Mr. Reid. So I'd, I'd like to clarify what my question was, that on this site, not perhaps this application, but, but anything, that there could potentially be resolution of a development of some sort. I wasn't saying that, you know, on this particular flooding, if that helps Mr. Reid as well, because um, I think that's what was that's what was referred to. And, and can we talk of any, but of the one that's been given the outline? The yeah, it's, it's like if, if we basically what I was trying to achieve was if we deferred today, for example, is that was that just going to lead in an, in a still an objection or whether there was a foreseeable way in order that this could be resolved at some point, because if not, then we might as well determine it today, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe that helps Mr. Reid, because it's yep. quite unusual for a parish councillor to be asked questions by Mr. Reid. The, the, the reason why I asked the question uh, was to assist members, because if members are assured that there is a resolution as to all of the issues. Uh, the reason why I raised it is because <laughs> members need to be aware that um, the parish council have said that they will judicially review th this 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 application, and therefore, no, no. Th their issue is that the. The outline planning commission. Can I take this into the debate part? Because I think we have the, the parish council here with us. Oh, can I? Yeah, thank you very much. If that's okay. So thank you very, very much. I don't think we have any more questions or comments. Thank you very much for, for all of your time and for being with us here today. <laughs> thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll move forward to the other speakers and then on to the debate. Thank you very much. And um, we now have the local member, Councillor John Batchelor, are you with us? Sort of. <laughs> so we can, yeah. we can only just hear you. It's right, very strange to have you up there and <laughs> not here. <laughs> okay. Uh, afternoon, members. Nice to see you again. Um, and the protocol, don't you, for being there? Yes, I think so. But I'm sure you'll put me right if I go wrong. Okay, are we ready to go? Right, okay. So, um, afternoon everyone. Um, I'm here certainly to uh, support the parish council in their, their view of the world, um, in all respects except for one, in that I don't believe that there is a possibility of a resolution on this site. And the reason I say that is because I, I will now refer you to the appeal uh, decision um, on the reserve matters that this uh, this committee uh, refused before the one that we are dealing with now. The uh, the appeal inspector had this conclusion. I conclude that the proposal would harm the character and appearance of the area. The development would be in conflict with paragraphs 127 and 130 of the framework, which collectively require that the development is sympathetic to local character and history, including the surrounding built environment and landscape setting. That is an absolute fundamental objection. It means that there should be no development on this site. The maybe Yes, I'm just about to do that. Okay. Because the one that we have before us, the inspector had full knowledge that permission had been given. 
and yet he made this very distinct uh, decision. So let's turn to the current position. Um, as you may, as you will be aware, um, the um, parish council is arguing that uh, this whole business is out of time and shouldn't even be before you. Um, the applicant seems to be agreeing with that in that he has um, give, uh, submitted a new outline application. What I want to see is all decisions stopped on this current one and allow the new uh, outline to come forward and for you to make uh, a proper judgment on it, given the current policies in place. Uh, as you know, as you've just been told, there is a judicial review pending. I believe that no further decisions should be made until the issues have been tested in court. To do otherwise would be unwise, unsafe, and not to say um, reckless. I would urge you to defer this now, uh, not only on these grounds, but also on the grounds that uh, have been outlined by the Parish Council in terms of um, the flooding, which is not addressing currently. You will also be aware that uh, the applicant has started work on the site and we're desperate that um, this should be stopped before uh, irreversible damage is, is done. So please defer this uh, and yeah, let, let's preserve uh, an area which, which should never have been given permission on. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor John Batchelor. Councillor Evans. Thank you, Chair. And through, sir, could I just clarify? Um, the local member is so he's asking for a deferral because he also said about that everything. Sh I thought I caught everything should be refused. So. Just clarifying where his where his position is on on refusal versus deferral, and and I'd also like to, on top of Councillor Batch's reply, ask officers as well, kind of to understand the implications of deferral and refusal for or acceptance for the committee, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, yes, Councillor John Batch, do you want to answer that question? Y y yes. On it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, uh, the. Whether you accept the the um, parish council's argument that it's already uh, out of time or not, it would be out of time in November anyway. On the the current application, it actually goes out of time early in November. My, I what I want to happen is for us to go past that date and for the new uh, outline to be um, decided. I'm perfectly happy with either one, personally. I, yeah, that's fine. Uh, you don't, we don't have to press you on it, so thank you very much. It's just a clarification. Um, yes, and um, before we go on, can I ask Michael? What, what, thank you very much. I don't, oh, no, we have got other questions for you, first of all. Okay, so, um, members, I'm just thinking whether we want this clarification from officers before we go any further about the implications of that. Yes? Um, Michael, do you can you help us at all in terms of the implications of deferral refusal um, in this case for for the committee? You know what it would mean. Um, I can try. Um, I personally don't see the benefit of a deferral. I think if if members are not happy with the scheme that is before them, then then the application should be refused. But the application is presented to you with full technical support of the lead local flood authority who are present today i should have mentioned that at the end of my presentation so we do have hillary ellis from the rfa who can answer any technical questions that members may have um as councillor john batcher has highlighted the notwithstanding the the judicial review uh, letter from the parish council um the consent does lapse in november um Clearly, deferring the item to an October or November committee is simply pushing the issue down the line to 
potentially hit that trigger. So my advice to members would be that, and, and Stephen Reid obviously can chip in, that the asset out in the report and update report officers are satisfied that the committee are in a position to make a decision on this application today. The the original submission to discharge surface water drain and, and several other conditions was made two years ago. Um, this is actually the third application that relates to surface water drainage. It has been through rigorous assessment. Um, to my understanding, there isn't any mandatory, or I forget the, the terminology that the parish council used, there is no restriction from a technical body that prevents us from, or the committee from making a decision today. Following the unfortunate flood events that occurred in Linton at the end of July, the lead local flood authority did write to the council asking for a pause on this application and the Bartlow Road site while further investigation was undertaken of those events. That is in one of the appendices to this report. Following additional um, work from the lead local flood authority, we received a further letter, which is also appended to the report, that confirmed that um, in light of the further evidence that had arisen from the events in July, they remained of the view that the scheme um, in front of you for the Bartlow Road site offers uh, an appropriate scheme of surface water drainage in accordance with the condition and therefore lifted that pause that they had asked us to put on, which is you know, why we're now here with you today. Um, so in my view, I, I don't see what would be achieved from a deferral. This process has, has been going on for two years. Lots of amendments have been made to the application in response to concerns of the Parish Council and technical consultees. In my view, we won't reach a position where we would receive a letter of support from the parish council in terms of the surface water drainage scheme. Um, and I would, I, I'm sure Stephen will chip in, but my advice is that um, the scheme before you should be determined. If you feel it's not a suitable scheme, then clearly the committee is entitled to go against officer recommendation and refuse the application. But what I am presenting to you um, with the consultation of the lead local flood authority is that members do have a suitable scheme in front of you for uh, the decision today. Yes, Sorry. It's, fine to have, it's fine to have more information about what, what you've written in the officer report. I think it was more, given that we're in sort of a legal maze, kind of with this, it was really understanding where were there implications for us as a committee. As I understand, it's still up to us, whatever decision there is, you know, um, and we, we now understand kind of what it would mean to defer, you know, but, so, but we have got the information in front of us. So thank you very much. And did you want to come back on that at all? Um, no, I mean, Councillor John Batchelor may now he's heard the officer's advice. No, he doesn't get a chance to come back, he just has a chance to answer questions. <laughs> Councillor Deborah Roberts, is there a question for Councillor John Batchelor? Chairman, my question was the same as has just been answered. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, no other questions for Councillor John Batchelor. Thank you very much um, for being. Oh, Councillor Dr. Marcy Khan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor John Batchelor, and we will now, members, move to the debate and any questions we have that can help enrich that debate. It's been uh, made clear that we have got a representative of the LLFA, so the, the Lead Flood Authority, and I think we should make, obviously, use of them um, and their expertise as well. So, Councillor Dr. Tumi Hawkins. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I definitely would like to ask the uh, LLFA um, how come their views uh, differs so uh, dramatically from that of the Parish Council. And specifically, how old are the maps that they've used <laughs> in assessing this scheme uh, in comparison with what's happening currently now, as the Parish Council has actually um, explained to us? And considering the Parish Council shows 1968 as well. So and they do, I understand that. But the yep. question, yep. What, what the Parish Council said was the, um, you know, currently the line of where the flooding is has actually come much more forward. And than, so thank you very so much. If, who do we have um, from the Lead Flood Authority? Hilary Ellis. Hello, Hilary. Thank you, Hilary. Hi, thank yeah. you very much for being with us. So um, I think if you heard Dr. Councillor Dr. Tumi Hawkins' question there as well, we also heard the case officer refer to the fact that the um, that there was a stop and there was a review following the flooding. So it would be good to understand what happened during that, that review um, as well. Thank you very much. Yep, no problem. Thank you. Um, so I 
two questions um, in one in terms of why does our view differ so much from the parish council um, so rather complicatedly I suppose the the flood maps are generated by the environment agency um, so the maps that show the flood zones two and three which are the you know the blue areas on the maps they're the environment agency maps um, we do also have a map in our in one of our own documents uh, which the Lin, uh, Linton Parish Council pointed out which shows the 1968 flood outline um, I've checked where we got that information from and again we actually got that from the Environment Agency who confirmed that was the, the flood outline. The, we did involve the Environment Agency in this, if it's slightly out of our remit of surface water drainage normally we look at the actual drainage on site rather than the flood outlines but we did involve the Environment Agency to ask them what are your thoughts given that we have got uh, maps that suggest there was flooding in 1968 that extended up into the site and um, they still haven't raised any objection on those grounds um, and the most up-to-date environment agency mapping which is used um, is is what has been used by the applicant and that when they do review flood mapping um, whenever they undertake that as the environment agency that does take into account previous uh, historic flood events to calibrate that model so we're going on the best available information we've got and we're sort of relying on the environment agency ourselves actually on the the flood outlines um, the maps as i say are are the most up to date they're the ones that are available now on the um, environment agency website or the gov.uk website and that modeling has been undertaken in recent years um, so you know well since 1968 um, in terms of the stop and the review following the flooding in july we as i say because we had the two live applications in linton we thought it was um, the safest option was to ask for a pause on both of them while we investigated um, in both cases the flooding was actually caused by surface water and um, so the rainfall that fell that was extreme whereas these flood outlines for this particular site relate to the river flooding um, which we didn't experience in July so when we re reviewed the surface water drainage strategy we didn't feel that there would be any adverse impact on flood risk as a result of the development thank you for that answer and Councillor Heather Williams oh sorry do you want to come back Councillor Cunningham uh, yes, thank you. Um, I don't think my question has been answered because I still don't know when the last, when the uh, flood map was last updated. Recent years means what, five, ten, um, or last year? <laughs> uh, because obviously, uh, as time changes, I would expect the Environment Agency to actually, you know, improve the mapping. But it sounds like perhaps that hasn't happened. So when are we talking about recent years? What is recent? So, and, and also as I, I mean, I don't know whether it's, as I understand, off what has, is un, has let out a consultation at the moment, which is looking at increasing the, the risks, you know, and the frequency from one in 100 to even one in 500 as well. To, so we, we have to update the way we look at flooding. I mean, obviously we're under the current regulations, but yes. So w what is, the, the, the latest maps that have been made available by the Environment Agency. I actually don't know the date off the top. I can try and find it out while we're on this call um, to see if I can find out. But I know that they review them every six months, but they don't necessarily update the modelling every six months. But I can try my best to find out. I'm not quite sure. OK, thank you. And yeah. Thank you, Chair. And, and through yourself, can I just clarify um, it was mentioned that the Environmental Agency haven't uh, yet raised any ob objections. Have they responded? I only say this because that's, you know, is it a case of they haven't responded or they have responded in a positive way towards the application? And, and is that, can you answer that, Hilary, or is that one that Michael can answer? I think it's probably best for Michael. Yeah, yeah. so I can come in on that one. Um, were consulted and have responded and that should be reflected in the consultee section of my report. I'm just trying to find you the paragraph number. Yes, paragraph 21 of my report. Uh, the uh, um, Six, for those who've got the printed papers. We've received two formal responses from the Environment Agency raising no objection to this application for members. Okay, thank you very much. Um, you are, is that fine, Councillor Williams? Yeah. Do we have any other questions for 
and the flood authority. Um, could I could I ask one? When you, I, I don't know if you can answer this or whether it will be during the debate, Hillary, but um, in your professional opinion, when you did the pause and you went and looked at the at the site, and as you said, that wasn't um, it was flooding due to surface water drainage. But in your professional opinion, that that is something that's going to be you know, part of the situation ongoing. You know, we get increased intensity and frequency of flooding due to climate change. We are going to have surface water flooding as part of the, the, the flood risk, and there will be a link to that and the surface water um, drainage, even then to, you know, where that goes into foul water drainage at times, it's linked. Is that, in your professional opinion, um, something that is going to happen with greater frequency going forward, or even now? I mean, I can't say categorically, but from what we've seen, it appears that that frequent won't be sort of intense and the extreme rainfall is appearing more frequently. It does appear that way, yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's so, something that hopefully national guidance and policy will change towards that. Thank you. And that's exactly the point I wanted to do. And this is exactly the situation that we're in with planning committee when we haven't got the rules catching up in a way with, with, with the situation, but we have to make decisions according to the rules, you know, that are here at the moment, which is often why I think we wanted that to sort of be done, perhaps if it had been possible in, con in consultation with the, the community, but as we've heard from both the local member and the community in the parish council, they just think the whole thing is unsuitable anyway and inappropriate anyway, so that's not necessarily very possible. Is there a question for the lead flood authority? Oh yes, thank you. Sorry, just to make you aware, so I'm using the modern gov paper three our pages are different, okay. hence my puzzle look. So I'm 392 Thank when you. you're 396. So I will I will make sure when I say it's a printed page, I'll say that, but I won't know what yours is on. Yeah, I, I maybe just if we can try and marry it up so that those of us trying to do the paper free trial. So what I'll do is we'll, don't get lost. we'll mention the paragraph rather than the page. That'd be great. Thank so you. So we were looking at paragraph 21 there on the Environment Agency. Yeah. Dr. Toomey Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just uh, one last question, I think, for the LLFA, which is, did they actually have face, uh, meetings with the parish council and discuss this yeah. discrepancy? Dur yes, during, during the pause, or at any point? At any point. Um, yes, we have had quite a few discussions with Linz Parish Council um, about it. We've reviewed their correspondence as well, and we have met them on site, albeit to discuss primarily the Horsey Road site, but we have also discussed some Butler Road areas as well, and we've had meetings with them. Can I just jump in on that one as well? There was a meeting held on the 26th of July um, with Linz Parish Council, the Lead Local Flood Authority, Anglin Water and the Environment Agency to discuss the, the heavy rainfall event. So there was a very well attended meeting um, and, and, yeah, discussions between all parties. Uh, but we have them with us. I, I just wanted to let members know that we do have um, somebody here from Anglian Water as well. Yeah, yeah. And this is just about, but they are here. If we did have any questions, but just, just so you know that. But that's about the foul water drainage rather than the surface water drainage. And we're looking at surface water drainage. Um, do we have any other? <laughs> the real hand, Councillor Dr. Martin Cohen. It's really more for the, uh, um, for the planning officers. Um, you, the uh, parish council expressed that uh, on adjoining the development, there was one meter difference between the floor heights and the uh, highest flood point, and they found that acceptable. Uh, according to the uh, information provided here, there's 700 millimeters difference between the highest flood level and the floor, proposed floor heights. Would it be possible to impose a condition to increase that to a, a similar one meter level, or is that something that is not possible within the conditioning of this uh, application? As, as I think, yes, I think it goes to the, the heart of this, yes. Chair, I think my advice would be that the committee is here to consider the details of the discharge, this discharge of condition application. If those details are unacceptable to you, then it should be refused. But otherwise, we need to determine it on the basis of the submission before us, not to sort of seek to redesign it at this stage. Chair, I also wonder if it might be helpful just briefly to hear from Michael Sexton with regard to the um, point the Parish Council made about plan numbers and plan C14 and C15. Do you think there's a fairly straightforward explanation for that? 
So we'd heard from the parish council that they'd not been able to see or be consulted on both versions of the map, if that was what I heard correctly from them. Uh, yes, Chair, yeah, there is a, a, a plan with a, a lengthy drawing number and then revision C14 and C15. Um, the only difference between the two plans is C14, um, which illustrated the southern part of the site, showed some foul water arrangements connecting into the Bartlow Road sewer. Clearly, they're not related to the discharge conditions application for surface water drainage. But having received that comment from the Parish Council, I felt it was necessary to ask the developer to remove that particular element from the plan so that in the event that we did approve the surface water drainage scheme, there could be no grey areas on whether we'd also approved a foul water connection to Bartlow Road. Therefore, revision C15 of the plan is identical to C14 in all respects, apart from the fact it does remove the foul water um, drains. And because that was simply removing an element that wasn't relevant to the application, it wasn't necessary to reconsult because no other details have changed. It was simply removing an area um, so there was no ambiguity in what might be approved. It was simply removing foul water connection, if that helps. I mean, yes, thank you. Councillor Dr Richard Williams. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I just wanted to go, go back to a, a point that's been previously mentioned, and I think, Chair, it may have been something that you, you said you were going to ask officers to, to, to say a few words on, but um, I'd just like some clarification about the, the legal situation here. We, we, we've had the submission from the Parish Council that we can't lawfully determine this. Uh, that was reflected, I think, in the comments of Councillor Batchelor, of course, I take very seriously to be the former chair of this committee. Um, so I, I would welcome some clarification on that point, because it appears from what's being said that the plan commission has actually expired, or is not extant at the moment. Could I ask for clarification on something that's suggested in some of the documents, um, which is that if we were to grant this uh, discharge of condition, that would revive a previous um, permission that was not extant. I, I saw some potential reference to that, so I, 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 I'd like some clarification on whether discharging this condition, if we were to accept that the original permission was, was not extant, if we were to grant this nonetheless, would that somehow revive that? Okay. There would some, be some suggestion about yeah. that. So I would so, welcome some clarification. And, and we've... I will pass this on to officers, but just sort of chairing this, we've been subject to a huge amount of documentation, you know, just in the last sort of 48, 20, you know, hours around this, and even more in the last 24 hours around this. Um, but as I understand, one of the things that we have received, and I read it um, very early this morning, was on the council's response to that issue about whether or not it was extant. So the pre-action protocol we received from the, from the council, the, their response to that one. So there is a difference of opinion as to whether or not this is extant, and the council is saying that um, it is rebutting. You know, they have a difference of opinion. But I think we'll go to your point, which is the legal situation for us, you know, in determining this. Sorry, just, just to clarify, I, I did see that as well, but given it's come up in the meeting, I think some clarification in the meeting. Would what do you want clarification useful. on? The council's uh, position on this? Council's position, and then that, that second point. Okay. Right. Chair, if I may take the second point, I think that um, line of argument r relates to the next item on the agenda, the Section 73 application, rather than this one. Um, but I'll let perhaps Mr. Reid comment on the other point. Um, I think my view is that it relates to both applications, um, and the position is that if you were to grant approval on this application, then we're on notice that the Parish Council would judicially review the approval on the basis that it's not within your jurisdiction to grant the approval because they argue that the outline permission has already lapsed and therefore it's not within your discretion to approve this application. I hope, I hope that's clear. So, it would then be for the court to determine whether um, if you were to grant the approval, whether they would overturn the approval on the basis that it wasn't within your gift to 
approved because the outline had already lapsed. But Stephen, you can now clarify what, what is the council, your position on that, whether it makes stamp or not. So, it's so, the only thing we can base our decision. So the, the, the council's position is that the, the thrust of the position of, of the, the, the parish council is that access has not been approved pursuant to reserved matters, that the time limit for approval of reserved matters has been and gone, and therefore, because they did not approve access pursuant to the reserved matters timetable, they can't try and do that now. They've run out of time, and it's on that basis that they argue that the permission has lapsed. So, Stephen, lapsed. once again, that is the parish council's position. I'm just asking uh, you what... Our, our, the legal advice is that access was granted as part of the outline permission, and therefore the permission has not lapsed in such regard. That's what I understood from what I read. Okay. Thank you. So... This is this is this is really really hard. Um, my my first thing is, you know, this is what happens when we have uh, something as big as this, which is approved on appeal, and it was you know five-year housing land supply issue, and so we're we're now in this kind of grounds. <coughs> so we have in before us. I think we can only determine, you know, whether or not this is judicially reviewed, we have had legal opinion from the council that we can determine this, that it, isn't, um, that it is extant. What we're then looking at is, for me, is the fact that this was so complex, it was asked that there were pre-commencement conditions that had to be in place pre-commencement, and that there was um, work with the, with the parish council around this. And that didn't happen. Um, and what we also have to look at is very seriously is that our statutory consultees have looked at this and said that it is technically sound so that this discharge of condition could happen because it is technically sound. So what we are in a bit of a legal minefield, but we're also being asked to look at, um, for me, it's the condition had two things. One is how technical the condition is and the other is the timing of the condition, um, which was a pre-commencement condition. So, you know, we have to look at this, this balance in the round in a very, very complex situation. Um, and I do think, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I do think we need to um, determine rather than defer. And so I would ask members to think whether this is refusal or acceptance of um, the recommendation. And uh, I wouldn't be supporting an, you know, a, a motion for deferral. Um, so we're being told technically we have grounds for acceptance, we, we have heard the concerns around the fact that this was pre-commencement and it wasn't pre-commencement, and yet it was so sensitive. We all know it's such a sensitive site, so there's a timing um, issue around that and compliance with it. Um, and the fact that on the outside of all this, um, there, there is a lot of a, a legal context. For me, the, the fact that we are looking at in flooding conditions, what, I, what I'm finding very hard is I know we have to deal with the rules we have in front of us. And if not, then, you know, somebody could appeal and win the appeal against us. But I do think the rules are not keeping up to date with um, climate change. I know that there's a government consultation now. They will be changing the rules, I, I consider, but we don't know that yet. So we cannot yet base our decisions on what we think should be the rules. Um, I don't know if that's being very helpful, <laughs> members, but this is where my headspace is right now. Um, yeah. And I would like to say that I can hear that there has been considerable engagement both from our case officer and from the Leeds Flood Authority and they did pause and stop and they did go and review. So, uh, you know, that is a good thing that there has been that engagement. I wish we would have seen more of it on behalf of the applicant. Counts, is that first we're councillor? Debate, no? Yes, we're in the debate. Councillor Heather Williams. Mm -hmm. That's what I was kind of framing for our debate. That's all right. Thank you, Chair. So I've just, just been um, 
doodled on by Councillor Roberts, so we might have to do some distance there we'll if I start to flinch. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, I think I think you're you're right. Deferral is it's a yay or a nay today. We're at that point now. So I think the, the suit various things I think we need to clarify. So for me, yes, deferral is is gone. Um, I need to take the legal advice that we've got that we can um, can sort of make a decision today on it. Um, it and it does feel that um, we're, we're sort of in a in a minefield of like say a legal a legal minefield that one way or another somebody else is probably going to decide. But we often get into this conflict of um, technical advice and local knowledge. And it's a constant frustration of mine, and I'm sure it is of everybody, that we have local residents that literally see it. They see it, for example, flooding twice a year, and then they're told it's a one in a hundred event. Um, given everything that is, that is going on, and given the level of knowledge and local knowledge, I'm, I'm minded to refuse, and I, I appreciate very much that we're going to be told about the technical advice and everything else, but I, I do feel on this one, we need to give local knowledge a chance. Um, and for me, I will be um, minding that, that way. We, we've got evidence of the flooding. We, we know of the problems in the area. And like you say, it, it's rare to have pre-commencement conditions. So it, it's a recognized issue in the area. Um, so it's... Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give local knowledge a chance on this one, and and I'm minded to refuse. Thank you, Councillor Peterson. Thank you, Chair. Um, this one was a decision that was due to be taken by the 18th of June. Um, the outline planning commission was granted in September 2017, whatever the process. The reserve matters was granted 15th of November 2019. We have just been advised by our legal advisor that that has not lapsed. Um, we asked the parish council, oh, forgive me, I forget exactly who asked, whether this was something that was capable of resolution. We had, yes, of course. Uh, we had rather a long answer, but I wasn't satisfied that it amounted to the word yes. Um, we had a very persuasive representation by, forgive me, I'll call the senior local member, um, by the local member. It seemed to me the gist of that was that if it hadn't lapsed, we should defer it until such time as it had lapsed. I'm not entirely convinced that we could go along with that. We then look at the advice we have received from our statutory consultees on this, and we heard from the LLFA this morning, and we're informed that that advice takes account of a meeting of all parties, including the LLFA and I believe Anglian Water with the Parish Council on 26th of July, that is since the heavy flooding which I believe occurred on the 20th of July. In the light of all that evidence, when we're faced with the question, do we agree to the condition submission of details required by condition 10 on surface water drainage. Uh, we've been advised this has been separated from the foul water drainage. I find it very difficult to say that we should not now approve that and that we should again defer this matter or fail to decide it. We are not here to say whether we, are, whether we think we would grant a planning application in the first place. We are not here to say whether we would have approved the reserve matters. We are here to confine ourselves to that particular question. In the light of the evidence we have heard today, I don't believe we can come to any decision but to approve the meeting of that condition. Thank you. Thank you. I am just coming. <laughs> <laughs> Council Dr. Martin Scott. <laughs> um, uh, taking the points that uh, Councillor Fain has said uh, in broad terms, I'm in agreement. Um, this is a site that obviously we would not have approved in the first place, but it was decided on appeal. 
capacitors put uh, exchange. We've gone through various uh, reserve matters which have already been approved. Um, I, as I obviously explained, would have been happier if there was one meter between the high, uh, the lowest um, floor level and the highest uh, flood level as, as predicted. Um, and there is only 700 millimeters. So the question really comes down to whether I consider 700 millimeters acceptable. The flood authorities seem to consider that acceptable. Uh, I don't think, in terms of the, uh, the examinations that they've done, that I, uh, that I can see that we have grounds, like, like Councillor Payne, that we have grounds to, to refuse this. However much I might not have wished this development not to have taken place in the first place. Um, so I, I think as I come around to the opinion that we, uh, we should approve this application. No other speakers? Oh, Councillor Burrow? Thank you, Chairman. Um, right. Oh, you did want to speak. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> um, yes, Chairman. I mean, we have a huge responsibility uh, where flooding um, is, is any sort of a threat. And we know around the district we have various places um, where there is a big water problem. One can think of Swayze, one can think of Toomey Hawkins, Councillor Toomey Hawkins' own area where we've seen huge flood areas over the time when we've been into that patch and visited them, and Linton. Um, I mean, it's practically notorious for the amount of flooding that it gets and, and how regularly it gets them. And on page 425 of the paper copy... Paragraph, please. Um, it's, it's sort of well, three down. It says... During storm conditions, surface water floods from the hill down the site and into the Bartwell Road, regularly described as running like a river. Uh, and I'm quite sure that that observation is, is absolutely correct. Um, now, we have two contrary legal opinions. That's not unusual. Um, and we've had legal opinions ourselves in the past which um, actually haven't stood up to, to um, actually um, investigation. So I think we've got a situation now where we have two differing legal opinions, and I think uh, the, the word that Councillor John Batchelor used would it, was that it would be reckless. Well, I actually think uh, it would be irresponsible um, of this authority to go along with uh, this situation and approve it, given that there are so many um, various and variant uh, opinions, information, um, I cannot believe for a moment that any parish council in South Cambridge, or even the larger ones, would go down the route of judicial review uh, if they hadn't had advice that it would be worth their while doing so. Judicial review is a very serious uh, matter to take on board. It's very expensive. They will have to take, uh, I'm sure, counsel um, and planning consultants on board to argue their case. Now, they wouldn't be doing it if they didn't believe that they had a, a strong case to argue. Uh, and I'm afraid, I, I'm beginning to think that actually um, they are probably correct that the uh, approval has fallen, by the way. And if that is proven to be right, and we don't take that into account today, I think we're going to be in dire trouble. Um, and I think, quite rightly, we'd, we would be in dire trouble um, for ignoring that. I, I think it's one of those that really we do have to be safe rather than sorry. Um, and uh, I, I think that really, I, I agree, this is a, a yes or no today. A, a deferral uh, wouldn't, I don't think, um, achieve anything because I think that the, the differences are so large um, that it, it, it's actually what is needed is a new application to see how, how that would run now, given what we know. But I'm afraid, I have to say, I think it would be entirely irresponsible and very uh, dangerous for us, and could be very expensive for <clears throat> us to go down this route. And 
if we do get a, give it approval, um, and there is um, what is envisaged by the uh, residents of Linton, if that happens, how could we actually um, sleep at night knowing that today we had a chance for it to be really reconsidered, but we gave it and we let their homes flood? I, I can't go along with that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, Councillor Dr. Jimmy Hawkins. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm finding it a bit this difficult. I know that sometimes we've had data from Africans, especially with flood calculations, that have not been quite accurate. Um, and in fact, in one of my um, cases, it's been local residents who've torn it apart and made them go back <laughs> to square one, so to speak. Um, but I'm also concerned that we seem to have statutory maps that don't take into account what's actually happening now. Um, and what that means is we potentially will be making decisions based on inaccurate information. I know what's before us, we've seen what's before us, but I'm still not convinced that the flood maps being used are accurate enough. And I know that Linton have gone to a lot of trouble um, actually to raise their concerns and I do salute them for you know, what they've done, it can't have been easy. Um, I say it's, it's a tough one. We need to determine this. I still haven't made up my mind. What, 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 well, that's hard. I think we have to have the, the fairness both to the case office of the flood authority, <coughs> the applicant, no. and, and the parish council is there are a set of rules that are out there, a set of published maps. This is how all kind of things are determined, but we're concerned that they, they're, not, they're not right. That's what you're saying. I am concerned that they're not right, mm. and that is from personal experience in my ward. Mm -hmm. um, whilst I know that there's no objections and there's no objections, but we know, uh, you know what sort of goes on mm -hmm. on a day-to-day -day mm -hmm. basis. And frankly, potentially, this is one where we probably need to throw it back at the floor authority to go, what the heck are you doing? Mm -hmm. you know, how, 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 does, how do they update it? You know, where's the feedback? Do they get feedback from residents and do they update their maps on that or they just leave it and go, you know, yeah. It's okay. I don't know, but no, I'm not happy. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Councillor Judith Griffiths. Um, Councillor Dr. Timmy Hawkins has said my thoughts probably far more eloquently than I can. So yeah. I think I will be voting to refuse this application. Yeah. Councillor Eileen Nixon. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I too am. Um, um, member for a ward where we have um, sudden flooding, where, it, where it's not in the flood zone, um, awful problems, and I'm very conflicted over this because on the one hand we have the first-hand experience on the ground and on the other hand we have a set of maps and rules that tell us that isn't happening. So the experience that people have come to talk to us about, I think we need to listen to that. And I, I too, I don't feel like I can support this at all because of that. And Dr. Council, Dr. Mm -hmm. Council, Dr. Richard mm -hmm. Williams. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, like, like other members, I, I find, find this a difficult one. Um, I'm putting all the legal disputes to one side. I'm not, 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 not considering that given, given what was said earlier. Um, so just looking at this um, on, on the ground, I, I do share the concerns of other members. I, I think it's very important that, that our decisions don't become entirely about reports and preset maps and, and that we do take account of, of, of local knowledge. And I do find the evidence that's been put before us by the parish council um, and, and actually by the local members as well um, quite persuasive. And, and I think it, it is important that we we do take account of real-world information and, and not just from an automated system, as I say, but, but you know, preset maps. Um, and on that basis, 
after having struggled with this, I, I think I am minded to refute as well. Um, Councillor Claydon, please. Dr. Claydon. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, it's it's a very difficult one, and we've heard a lot. We've had a lot of information. Um, I want to pay tribute to the people who've spoken this morning, um, to the case officer, to Lady Parish Council, to the local flood authority, providing us with such clear um, information. Um, I think that, um, as other people have said, we, those on the ground, those experiencing flooding, those living with it uh, on, on a very regular basis, we have to pay attention to what they've said and to balance that with the other evidence that we've been given. Um, and I'm coming down on the side of uh, refusing. I was trying to work out the uh, what the initials M E were. Me. <laughs> Thank you, Chair, for your indulgence. Um, yes, I, I share the Councillor Johnson's concern, indeed that of other members, about the importance of taking account of local knowledge and the detailed assessments in this case. However, I'm a bit worried that we are saying, I think, um, this came up from what Councillor Hawkins said followed by Councillor Rippett and Councillor Wilson, that we have doubts from our own wards about the accuracy of the Environment Agency information here. They are a statutory consultee, and their assessment is assessed by the local uh, LFA, LLFA, and we have heard from them today. And I'm just a bit concerned that if we take the view that we never get accurate advice from the Environment Agency, sorry, I know somebody, nobody actually said that, then it would be very difficult for us to resolve any planning applications. Mm. We have to take advice from our statutory consultees and assume that they have assessed the concerns that we may have about the accuracy of the data. And now it's M-E-Me. -E -Me. Yes, yes. So I'm very much chairing this. I don't want to go now into every single planning application around every single application that is in a flood zone you know, one or two, that we've got local experience of flooding, because we all have, and, and therefore we don't trust the statutory consultee. And that's what I was saying. We've got evidence in front of us that the statutory consultee, not only have they done it, they stopped everything. They went. They went after the flooding event, and they reviewed, and they reviewed their information, together with the local community as well. So a huge amount of, you know, effort has been put in, not just maps. I think it's much, much more. It's been about how does the system work and looked at what were the causes of this on the 20th of July. My concern, therefore, my concern is a bigger one because I think the rules will change and this is a big, big application. So, and, and I think our statutory consultees will soon be catching up with climate events because the, the rules and the guidance will change around that. And, and up until then, things are, um, are, are subject to, to things that haven't caught up with that. But where is my greater concern? My greater concern was that oh, this was a pre-commencement condition. And it was supposedly to be done pre-commencement and together with the, the local community. Now, what's in front of us is whether it was pre-commencement pre or um, done without it being, as they're doing at the moment, they're, they're discharging it already. It looks like it would have been the same thing and it would have been approved by the um, by our statutory consultees, so that the, in some ways the timing isn't different because it's, it's what's in front of us supposedly is technically acceptable. My concern is on such a sensitive site, to have not complied with the pre-commencement condition is what is, on something that is so sensitive, is, is where I'm, I'm very, very concerned about this. Now, if we, um, is that enough to say refusal? <laughs> it's kind of what's in the rhetorical question is what's going around in my head um, is is a concern, um, but I'm still not decided on where, where I am actually. So, Councillor Richard Williams, Councillor Clare Johnson, then I think we'll move to a vote. Yeah, thank thank you, Chair. Um, just and thank you for taking this as I jump in. Just on that last point, I sort of put that out of my head 
because I was under the impression that breach of a material consideration, um, breach of a planning condition could not be a material consideration. Um, but I just welcome some clarification whether I'm, I'm right on that, because I, I, I say I had to put that out of my head. I could put it back in. Thank you, Chair. Through you, I think as summarised by the case officer, um, we've amended the recommendation to reflect the fact that they've started on site, so we would be agreeing to the details as being acceptable but not discharging the planning condition given that they have breached the trigger which was pre-commencement, albeit of course it was due to be determined some time ago um, and I understand that the breaching of that trigger only occurred very recently, but um, yeah, thanks Jay. Okay, but the question was, is it material? Did a material planning consideration a breach? Well, we're, it, well I don't think it's, it, in, in my opinion, what we're looking to decide is whether the technical details of the surface water drainage scheme are acceptable. Um, and uh, in that sense, the, breach, the breaching of the trigger doesn't really affect whether or not that scheme is acceptable as a solution to deal with surface water drainage. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Councillor Claire Daunt and then Councillor Dr. Tim Hilton. Um, yes, I just want to go back to uh, someone else who's got a microphone. Um, I, don't, I just want to go back to something that was alluded to um, earlier. I wanted to make it clear in my remarks that I... I it wasn't that I didn't have any faith in the, uh, in the information that was provided by the Lee, Lee local, local Flood Authority or by the Environment Agency. In my view, it's a balance. And that's what I, might, that's what I was trying to get across. I, you know, we, as I said in my previous remarks, we've had very good uh, reports from the case officer, and I thank him, and also from the other um, statutory consultees. But it is a balance. Thank you. And that's why it's before us. Yeah, absolutely. Councillor Dr. Tim Hilton. Thank you, Chairman. Supposing this was approved, but the condition cannot be discharged, how does that affect the permission then? It is it's being discharged already. No? no? Well, it's been written. We were just told that we can approve it, but it means the condition is not discharged. We cannot, it cannot be discharged ever again. I think that is, the, that, that is what's been advised. In that case, does that mean this site still then does have that information or not? Because when it comes to people buying anything on it, it can still show that this condition was not discharged. So how does that affect the planning permission overall? Oh, okay. Thank you, Chair. Through you. Yes, you're correct, Councillor Hawkins, that um, we would be agreeing the details but not discharging the condition. The condition would remain uh, undischarged or not discharged, want a better term. But what we're saying is that the technical details are acceptable and therefore we wouldn't be taking any enforcement action because the technical details meet the requirements of that condition, albeit they have only been discharged after, or sorry, provided after the event. At what point do they get discharged? They won't be discharged. We're just agreeing the technical details but not discharging the condition because the trigger was pre commencement and they have commenced. But then what's the implication of that? Was the implication is that we wouldn't take the enforcement action, but the condition would remain undischarged, uh, and that would flag on any search that a subsequent uh, purchaser may do, that there would be a letter there from the local planning authority saying that the details were acceptable, but the condition was not discharged because of the timing issue. Did you want to come back on that? Yes, I, I bring this up because I have had a query like that referred to me in the past where a self-builder went through this, exactly the same situation, but they couldn't have a certificate at the end of the build because they didn't discharge pre-commencement a condition, which was found okay. <laughs> so you might end up with people buying properties on this development that is not lawful, or does not have a lawful certificate to say that it's been built to all the conditions. Chair, through you, I think, I think that's a risk for the developer um, to have borne in mind before they made the decision to start on site, and I'm sure they did. Um, and then for any subsequent potential purchaser to also take a view on it. But you will show on the search, on the search results, yeah. when properties are being bought. Yeah, as I described yeah. earlier, there, yeah. you know, that will be there, but there, okay. there will also be a letter from, assuming it's agreed, uh, from the District Council saying that the details were okay. acceptable. Wow. Councillor Williams. Thank you, Chair. I just, I just want to clarify because I feel I may have got confused and we had some 
interesting interaction with this, the microphones, which meant it sounded like we had sweep from Sooty and Sweep on this side of the room for a minute. Um, lots of sweeping. So I just want to make sure I've understood this bit correctly. Um, is the advice that if we, we can refuse it today, but essentially we then wouldn't take enforcement action, so in which case there is no, like, what, what's the purpose of it? Through you, Chair, what I'm saying is if, um, if the application was approved, we wouldn't be discharging the condition. We would be confirming that the technical details are acceptable, but the condition wouldn't be discharged. If the committee decides to refuse the application, then you, the, the next step is for the district council to consider whether or not enforcement action is required as a result of that decision. Thank you, Chair. I just thought it might have been both way round, in which case I thought, what's the, po what's the, what's the point in this? But yes, okay, thank you for the clarification. Okay, I think we move to a, a vote, members. Um, on terms, if it was to be refused? Yeah, so um, I'll put my hard hat on for a moment. Um, it would be remiss of me not to highlight, as Councillor Bain has done, that um, clearly we have no technical um, consultee objecting to the details that have been provided, notwithstanding I've obviously heard what the committee has had to say. Um, I think a reason along the lines of the scheme being, that's been provided not providing satisfactory evidence that a method of surface water drainage um, or satisfactory method of surface water drainage um, can be provided, then that would be con contrary to policy CC7, 8, and 9 of the local plan. It's satisfactory, that's the point that kept us up. So you're saying policy? Uh, policies CC7, 8, and 9. And so, you know, and, and this is the hard thing in front of it. So, if, if that was then taken to appeal, and we have no evidence to show, except for local knowledge, that this is um, not technically sound, that's putting the council there. So, that, that's one of the things we have to take really seriously. I know, I know but I'm just saying this, the seriousness of it. Yeah. There is case law to that effect. Yeah. Yeah, there's well established case law to that effect. It was actually highlighted in the um, planning advisory service report that would come to the council as well. Um, of the, uh, the need, clearly it's for the decision maker to make their decision, but um, you know, the significant weight should be given to the advice of technical consultees, um, but it is ultimately a matter for the decision maker. Okay. Yes, we're ready for the vote. Oh, I'm not, I'm not sure. <laughs> No, I think we're going, oh, so in, we're moving to the vote, and the vote is in terms of the recommendation on, yes, exactly. I'm just a bit taken down. We've already voted. I didn't, my, mine didn't vote. Oh. But it's, it's not the blue. Uh, so you've read it, it's, um, it's just not accepted your actual selection. So uh, if you. Uh, it turned me on wrong. Well, what we were trying to vote is. Um, if you press that again, it should. There we go. Yes, okay, so that is um, refused with seven votes against um, two, four, and one abstention. It's 1.37, um, and I think we have a break for lunch. And until, I said 45 minutes, so should we say, 
quarter past, I think it's easier to say, but, we, but let's start at quarter past two.
Hello and welcome back everybody to South Cambridge District Council Planning Committee. We've just had a little break for um, lunch and we are now back in session and starting with agenda item seven, which can be found on in the paper pack on pages 451 to 530. now. This is application 21 slash 00629 slash 7S73 and it's land to the north and south of Barclow Road, Linton. The proposal is for an S73 variation of condition 11 of foul water drainage of the outline planning permission S-stroke 1963 slash 15 slash outline permission for the residential development for up to 55 dwellings with landscape buffer and new vehicular accesses from Bartlow Road. For revised wording to refer to the foul drainage design, the applicant is Abbey Developments Limited. The key material conditions foul water drainage. Um, is this a departure? Yes, because um, of the application being a departure from the development plan. And this is being brought to the committee um, because it's departure and a referral from the council's shared planning service delegation meeting and Paris Council objection. And the presenting officer, Michael Sexton, are you still with us, Michael? Hi. Hello. Hello there. Don't give up on us, you still there? No, no, I'm, Good. I'm here and I'm back again next time as well with other items for you, so. Excellent, thank you very much. Good, um, do you um, have any updates on this particular one? I do, obviously it does, quite closely to the updates I provided for the previous item but I think just for transparency I'll run through those again if that's okay chair. Um, so again further to the update report um, members were provided yesterday with a copy of 3C legal services formal response to the pre-action protocol letter that we've received. Um, there is actually an update to the main report as well. Um, paragraph 10 refers to a discharge of conditions application, which sought to discharge condition 11 um, as was imposed originally. Um, that was approved by the council on the 17th of September. Um, it says pending in the report, but that has now been approved. Um, as we've discussed on the previous item, uh, concerns were raised about commencement of works on site, which the enforcement team have investigated, and um, the agent has also emailed to confirm that works have indeed commenced on site. Um, that doesn't necessarily have direct impacts for the variation of the condition that's before members in this application. Um, an email was sent to all members on the 24th of September from Linton Parish Council um, with an attached letter that just reiterates their grounds for the judicial review and their feeling that the outline and the reserve matters consent have lapsed. Um, and again, an email was sent uh, yesterday by the Parish Council um, with various, uh, with an attached letter and two plans from the plans pack about um, discrepancies between the submissions and again just to confirm going through the points of the parish's letter the plans do have the same plan number but they are made to two separate applications the plan submitted to surface water drainage is in color and highlights the relevant areas of permeable paving etc for that particular condition whereas the foul water drainage application has the, the plan that grays out anything that's not relevant to foul water drainage and just highlights the foul water piping and associated annotations and that, uh, again, to confirm the drawing number referenced in that letter from the parish has been publicly available on the website and the parish were formally consulted on this Section 73 application on the 8th of March and the 7th of June. Um, no other plans have been submitted as part of that application, so that is the only one available. Um, and again, just to remind members, we received a letter, or Liz Watts, Chief Executive, received a letter from Lucy Fraser this morning, primarily related to the Horseheath Road site. Um, but there is reference to the Bartlett Road applications before committee today. Um, it doesn't raise any new issues, it just raises issues of judicial review and any other matters that have already been covered. Um, so I appreciate quite a lot of that was a repeat, but I thought it would just be helpful to clarify. So I shall move on to the presentation. If you could confirm, Chair, please, that you can see a presentation on the screen. 
Yes, thank you. Excellent. Okay, yeah, so this is a, a section 73 application to vary condition 11 um, about one consent 196315OL, which granted permission, outline permission for residential development of up to 55 dwellings with landscape buffer and new vehicular access. And the application seeks revised wording to um, condition 11, which I will come on to. And again, the site is land to the north and south of Butler Road, um, which is this site outlined in red, the parcel to the north, parcel to the south, and it's on the southeast corner of Linton outside of the development framework boundary. So the outline consent imposed a condition that prior to the commencement of early development, a scheme for foul water drainage that connects to manhole 7501 via a pumped regime shall be submitted and approved by the LPA. Um, I'll just jump back a slide. Um, manhole 7501 is located to the west of the development. Uh, over roughly over roughly around here. Sorry, my cursor is jumping around, but it just for reference, 7501 is, is quite a ways to the west of the site. Um, the section 73 application is seeking to vary that condition, condition such that the developer um, could connect to the existing network uh, on Bartlow Road at manholes 1501 and 2501, or via a, uh, a manhole 7501 via a pump regime, so it's given the option. There's a bit of complex history to get heads around on this one, um, as set out in the report. So the outline application was considered by the Council's Planning Committee in September 2016. Um, I'm not sure how many members on the committee today were on that one, some may recall. Um, two extra conditions are agreed by the committee relating to foul water drainage and surface water drainage, so including condition 11 that's before members today. The committee minutes set out that Linton Parish Council had submitted a report by an independent drainage consultant that advised connection to manhole 1502, Butler Road, was not acceptable. There was no technical objection from the uh, from Anglian Water to connection to the, the Bartlett Road system, but notwithstanding that lack of objection, the uh, committee resolved to grant permission with the condition that specifically required connection to 7501 via a pump regime, as set out in the report. And again, the application is, is seeking to vary the condition so the developer has the option of connecting to Bartlett Road system or 5701. Uh, again, just for context, this is the technical drawing for the foul water network um, coming down the northern parcel um, into an area of new piping which heads west of the plan, um, continuing along, connecting into the existing Bartlow Road system. And as you can see, the foul water connection from the site would also come up and connect into the Bartlow Road system, or the developer has the opportunity of, of pumping it through this pumping station along to Manhole 7501 off to the west. Um, so the key consideration um, is the, the foul water drainage because that is the condition that is being sought as, as being varied under this application. Um, the concerns of Linton Parish Council and third parties in relation to the scheme are noted. Um, again, the, the specialist advisors and statutory consultees consider the foul water system to be acceptable and to provide a satisfactory scheme. And officers are therefore of the view that given the lack of the technical objection, um, the, the recommendation that the condition should be varied is the one that is presented to members today. That is it. That is it for me, Chair. Oh, I should add, I, I believe we have um, Hannah Wilson from the from Anglian Water with us today. Thank you very much for to join the meeting. Um, and I do have some information uh, that the Parish Council would like to be displayed. So if they could let me know when they want that to pop up, happy to provide. Once again, oh, that's very, very useful. Thank you, Michael. So we will move now to, oh, uh, Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. It's um, just in the interest of transparency. Obviously, I, I do correspond and, and work alongside Liz Fraser at times, but just to clarify that I haven't had any communication in relation to this application at all. Yeah, okay. Good, thank you very much. And um, we'll now... So we have somebody with their video on, and the name is as 
16th web. Can you just turn your video off, please? Thank you very much. Yeah, and sorry. Welcome. welcome. <laughs> that's Thank <fine>. you. <laughs> and that's, that's myself. <laughs> that's fine. Um, good, so we'll now move to the public speakers and we um, have the parish council again and I don't know if the, the three of you are there to talk to us again, which is Councillor Kate Kell, <laughs> Councillor Enid Bold, and Colin Newell as well. Hello. 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 The same excuses as before regarding my lack of lung, um, but I have put on some blusher, so I don't look quite like a zombie anymore. <laughs> Thank you very much. Should I start now? I have some permission from the parish council. Right. This you is... want to have the pictures displayed yes, as yes, you're pictures. talking. Could you display the pictures, please? Yeah, and you have repeated, as we should do, that you have full authority oh. from the parish council to represent them. So thank you. Okay. Right. This is not a minor amendment, but it is a major change from the approved outline. Either. The drainage can join the specified manhole, 7501, or to go to Bartlow Road and through the village where the drains are old, in poor condition, and already overburdened. The wording of this amendment is neither precise nor enforceable. It is also clear the developer had no intention of implementing the condition. This application is not a revision of wording, but is required to be a new application. And this needs to be considered, the new application should be made and, need, and to be considered under the laws and policies that apply now. Not The current local development plan confirms the development is unacceptable in principle. The need for this condition was properly considered at outline, knowing the need to use a better section of the system. This was agreed by council, the applicant, and Anglia Water. All accepted the parish council consultant's report. The outline condition to go to manhole 7501, 7501 was clearly thought out to reduce the risk of water pollution and flooding to the village. We can see what happens when Bartlow Road sewer overflows. It's coming out down by the river, oh, as we see. And the next photo as well, please. You Thank can you. That one. This, this is what this is water coming up through that manhole like a fountain into the river. This is what happens when the manholes at Bartlow Road overflow. The protected chalk stream is polluted, and the village centre is flooded. The sewage system at the east of Linton was in parlous condition when our consultant wrote his report in 2016, much more so now with the only additional housing that's been added to it. Just to note, Anglia Water assess each manhole individually and not for their cumulative burdens. On the 20th of July, the system was overwhelmed following a burst of heavy, though not unprecedented, rainfall. Anglia Water has confirmed that the Butler Road sewer is shared between surface water and sewage. It's too much for the system and not preventing flooding. CCC puts a moratorium on development related to drainage in Linton. Excuse me a moment. <laughs> this investigation into the causes of the flooding has not been reported. This application is premature. Decision should wait until the review of surface water flooding and the sewage system has been completed and reported upon. Such a review was considered necessary at outline and now again following the recent flooding events. Following outline, it was never done. Okay. <laughs> the power and surface water conditions go to the heart of planning consent and need to be fully considered following review. Legally, it's also a mess, and solicitors acting for the parish council have served a pre-action protocol letter. You cannot lawfully vary conditions using S73 
when the outlying consent has lapsed. It is unlawful to remove the RM condition and its time scale when it's not been fully discharged. Right, unauthorised work has started on the house, has started. If there was still a live consent, this alone would invalidate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? Do Councillor Dr Tony Hawkins. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thanks again. Um, you mentioned that the three manholes, let me get this right. The analysis that was done by Anglian Water was done on a singular basis for each one, um, not on the cumulative impact of one to the other. Did I hear you right? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, and the reason again for the condition that it goes through 7501, The uh, Bartlow Road manholes are a combined system which, as you've seen from those photos, already overflow when they are stressed with um, too much surface water. Okay. So Sorry. to add any further foul water from this site is going to run the risk of, again, seriously compromising that sewer. Right. Thank you. I'm, I'm quite familiar with the, uh, the second picture that you showed because we have some that gets like that when it's at surface water inundation. So um, I wasn't surprised to see that. Um, if I may, the other, the other question I wanted to ask you was, um, uh, it's paragraph 90 and on the printed papers is page 467 in that uh, the applicant kind of contests your report and concludes that your August 2016 report was not prepared was not prepared to reflect the implications of development on the Battle Road site and uses incorrect methodology. What do you say to that? I was involved with that report. The report was originally commissioned to deal with the Bartlow Road site. However, uh, no, Bartlow oh, Road site. However, it was then transferred to look at the Horseheath Road site because the Bartlow Road site had already been approved. So but it's, it's, the same, it's the same. It's the same group of 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 uh, of uh, pipes. Right. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very mm. much. And as I said, Councillor Dr. Martin Khan. Um, the, uh, if they're connected to uh, if everything was connected to 7501 as originally proposed, uh, would that require less pumping than if it was uh, if it was used to the everything was pumped up things were, as if the other site was used on Bartlow Road? I'm not sure that we've calculated that. We're looking at the safety of the pipes. Um, the one going to 7501 is along Fleming's Field on the flat. The um, one going to Bartlow Road is uphill, quite a steep uphill climb. Yes, the, the one going to 7501 is a 375 diameter pipe as opposed to a 180, so as opposed to the old six inch, it's a larger pipe, which was the main reason for choosing it. It was a newer and larger pipe. I see there aren't any more questions, so thank you very much for your time. Thank you for being with us, and we'll see you again. But thank you for now. Thank you. Um, and we also have Councillor John Batchelor as the local member, I think, to speak to us. Yes, afternoon again. Uh, right, ready to go? Yes, please. Right, lovely. Okay, again, I won't detain you very long. Um, I'm here to, to support the view of the Parish Council, um, just to um, reiterate, uh, Linton has uh, largely a Victorian um, sewage system, um, which is part of the Bartlow Road one and is not um, doesn't sim it simply doesn't have the capacity. 
you, I'm sure in your papers you will have um, an independent survey commissioned by the parish council a few years back, which shows that uh, the whole system is close or, or at capacity. And any more um, stress put on the six inch pipe is just not acceptable. So just basically we should stay with the 7501 should this um, um, this project go ahead. As you know, my view is that uh, it shouldn't be there in the first place. And after the condition, yes. <laughs> and after your very good decision just, uh, just recently, uh, I hope that uh, this won't uh, actually be relevant. So thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm sure we will um, make use of um, Hannah from Anglia Water to also get their, their opinion on this. Uh, do we have any questions or comments or questions to Councillor John Batchelor? I don't see any. Thank you very much, John. Okay, so, thank you. Thank you. Members, so we are now um, to the debate during which we can ask questions either of the case officer, but also we have um, Anglian Water here with us. And it was Hannah, what was Hannah, sorry? Hannah Wilson. Hello, Hannah. Hello. Lovely to have you with us. Um, if you don't mind me asking straight, I'd like to ask a question. <laughs> so, um, yes, could you just explain to us um, why Anglia Water considers that this is technically sound, given the concerns that we've um, obviously just heard? And yeah, yeah, absolutely. So first thing just to clarify is that um, it's not a combined network. We're looking at a foul only network that they're proposing to connect to. And that that means exactly what, what it what it says is that that should be taking foul flows only that surface water should be um, managed and directed elsewhere and not into that foul only system. So when we look at a capacity assessment for a development site, we look at where that development has the right to connect to. And in this is instance, <coughs> excuse me, this development has the right to connect into Bartlow Road in that foul only system. And the assessment that we do is we look at the foul flows that will be coming from that site based on the properties and, um, and the occupation. Um, and we make an assessment based on the, those foul flows entering a foul only system. Now, what's happening is that you're getting surface water and um, groundwater runoff, which is entering a foul only system. That should not be there. And we can't take that into account as part of a capacity assessment. We have to look at that network as it was built and as it should be run, running to. So what we say is in dry weather flow conditions, that network is working effectively. Um, and we have um, been on site and we have looked at our network and we can confirm that it is running effectively for that, that condition, the, dr the dry weather flow, which is what it's built for. So apologies if I'm not making sense and please do come back with more questions. But basically the technical assessment on both connection points, so both manholes, shows that there's no mitigation required that the development can connect and the network is capable of accepting those additional valve flows from that development site without any mitigation required. Does that answer your question? That, that does. And, and when you said that you've been to the site and reviewed it, and was that also at the time of the flooding or just after the flooding, were you able to review it again? Yes, so we did some um, reviewing of the site of the area after flooding. We also reassessed and just checked calculations after the flooding just to make sure everything was done appropriately and accordingly. So we have we have done that and it came back with the same conclusion, that analysis that it can connect without mitigation required. And, and can I just sort of, it, it being a, a Victorian system and, and can't, so what? Yeah, so that's quite normal for a lot of our networks. The age um, isn't unusual um, and it's really, it's not, about the age um, and a small pipe can actually take quite a lot of capacity it's quite deceiving in that in that sense um, and it's more about um, the velocity of the flow um, and just just to be clear even a pumped connection 
um, we hold back and restrict flows at a pumped rate, so we're not allowing foul flows to come in unintenuated. And that's really what the assessment is, is all about, looking at more the technical details. If it's a pump flow, do we need to restrict that flow? Um, what's the material of the pipe? What's the gradient of the pipe? How does the actual flow travel? Um, and so having that, that older system isn't unusual at all. Um, and actually it works quite effectively. It's only when we see those extreme weather conditions and that surface water and groundwater getting into the foul only system, that's when we see these problems during flood events. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Councillor, Do Councillor Richard Bloom. Oh, thank you, Jeff. Um, I think there have been people before me. Um, yeah, there were two questions I wanted to ask, but, but I, um, just ask a clarification of, of, of Ms. Wilson. Um, did I understand you correctly? Did you say that it's supposed to be a foul only system, but there is surface water going into it, but you can't take account of that in your assessment? Is, is, is that, did I understand you correctly? Yeah, so I'll, I'll just elaborate if that's if that's okay. So it's a foul only system, so it's built for foul flows only. We do not seal. We don't. We do not have an entirely sealed system. You will see the manhole covers. They are not entirely sealed. Therefore, when there's extreme weather events, that surface water or, or surface um, groundwater from the land, it cannot seep into our sewers, and that's what causes the issue. Now, we. In new development sites especially, we look to ensure that that surface water is managed effectively and therefore not going into a foul only system. Um, we also under understand that over the years, historically, people may have had extensions or, or new driveways and unknowingly connected those surface water flows into a foul only system. And again, that's where the, the problems occur. Um, and surface water is very much um, a kind of multiple organisational remit to manage that. So you've got highways authorities and obviously the lead local flood authority. But um, when we look at the foul only system, we do allow when we have our analysis and assessment of growth, we allow for 25% infiltration of surface water. So even when we do an assessment, we do understand that there'll be that slight infiltration of surface water, but we can't build our systems to accommodate this extreme weather event and surface water and, and groundwater flows entering a system that is not designed to accommodate such flows. They should be dealt with effectively at source. Uh, come back. Yes, yes thank you, Chair. Um, um, thank, thank you to Ms. Wilson for that. I, I did have a second question, so I'll just go straight into that, if that's okay. I think this might be one more, uh, a question more for Michael, but I was wondering if, if um, um, somebody, potentially Michael, could just tell us why when the, um, conditions originally set, it was thought appropriate for the condition that it had to go into sewer 57501. Um, what, what was the thinking behind that original condition? Uh, my, my understanding, I wasn't involved in the outline application, is that obviously it brought to members to make a decision on, on the application as a whole. Um, as part of that consideration, there was the independent report from Minton Parish Council and at the committee meeting, members took the view that it would be appropriate to, uh, for want of a better phrase, side with the report of, of the parish council and impose uh, the condition that requires connection to 7501 rather than to the Bartlow Road system. So I think that was a decision made within the committee, uh, within the committee meeting, that that was the specific wording required that was felt appropriate at the time to um, ensure the um, delivered an appropriate system. I don't know how helpful that is, but... Thank you. And Councillor Aileen Wilson. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask, how, have there been any recorded incidents, or how many, of the surface water um, going into the foul water system? And um, the Parish Council mentioned that it overflows into the chalk streams and pollutes them. How many incidents of that have been of that in the past, say, five years with the um, severe weather? Um, thank you. Yes. So in regards to um, complaints or reports of incidents of sewer flooding, um, we did have a look for the parish council um, in Bartlow Road um, and there 
the reports of sewer flooding there over the past five years were, due, were mostly due to blockages or transferred sewers. So sewers that were not originally in our ownership, then they were transferred to us and, and potentially there was some maintenance work we had to do to ensure that they flowed effectively. Um, so in terms of the surface water flooding and extreme weather flooding, it's something that we've, we've seen recently, but we don't have a lot of historical um, complaints or records on it. It's not to say it hasn't happened. Sometimes they aren't always recorded or reported to us directly. It could be to the Lelog Flood Authority, the Environment Agency. Um, there are a number of bodies that people report to. In terms of pollutions, again, no record of pollutions. I can go back and check. Um, but as far as I'm aware, there's no record of pollution. And often what happens is when surface water enters our foul network, um, it can be the case that there's a if there's a pollution incident um, recorded, we have to then inform the Environment Agency who come and do tests. We do sample tests. And it could be that actually that discharge into the water course was so watered down by the surface water that it wasn't actually a pollution event. It's not to say it didn't happen. But there's levels of pollution and the Environment Agency do check those. Um, I can go back and, and double check that because I don't want to give you misinformation, but I'm certainly happy to pass it on to um, the case officer. So in the recent flood event, um, there were instances um, where they were backed up into their gardens and unfortunately into properties, but that was on the Lonsdale um, side of the, of, of the village. In terms of the Bartlow Road, I'm not aware. Um, and the records that I have um, show that the blockage, there were blockages, more blockages, or like I say, transferred sewers. Um, again, it's not something that I can say for certain. Um, I, I don't know if the parish council potentially know more, but um, I'm happy to share some of those reports. Obviously, I know you need to make a decision today, but we can be open and transparent and share those with the case officer if required. Councillor Dr. Martin Khan. <coughs> I'm coming back uh, again to the issue of the two alternatives, uh, 7501 or the ones in Bartlow Road. Um, uh, and, and the energy use for pumping. Um, can, how, can you give some indication about the amount of energy use for pumping for uh, for the one the Butler load solution and the other the other solution? Because obviously we're concerned about the use of energy uh, uh, and sustainability. Uh, and the less use there is of pumping, obviously the, le the more sustainable a, a solution would be found. So, in in terms of that level of technical detail, I I can't answer that. However, what I can tell you is that this development have put forward um, for us to adopt their on-site sewer network. So, anything that they do build um, and they want us to adopt, they have to build in accordance with adoptable standards, and our standards are the national standards that that water companies use. So, we ensure that it's done to a certain standard. In terms of energy, I can't be specific. So, I'm afraid I can't tell you that. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much, Hannah, for for your um, for being here because it's really really helpful that you're here and you can answer our questions as well and provide extra information. Thank you. Members, um, the debate. Oh. Councillor Dr. Tony Hawking. Sorry, uh, was that for Hannah? Okay. Yes, it's for uh, questions for Hannah Water. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. It's, um, I guess it's, it's going back to uh, your previous statement about the sewers being only for foul and not for um, surface water, but you do know that it does happen. Now, I'm glad to hear that you have a 25% allowance for infiltration, um, but what we have is a situation now where this is happening more and more. Um, and it seems to me that you need to be perhaps taking this problem into account more than you already are. So I go back to the question, at the time that the inspector gave the decision for the foul to go through 7501, 
I presume Anglia Water was present, had prepared something. So why is it now saying that it needs to, well, why are you now accepting that it can be buried? Because that wasn't part of what was... Uh, before we go to that, and can we just check with the case officer perhaps on that? Because I think it was the committee and council that did that rather than Anglia Water at the committee meeting. Well, that was part of the decision notice. That condition was part of the decision that it goes through 7501. Michael, can you, you weren't here, I know, but can you clarify that? Yeah. Sorry, I missed part of the question because my team's froze. It, could you just repeat, Councillor Hawkins, for my benefit? That mandated that the file goes through 7501. That was a condition that was imposed by the planning inspector. Is that correct? No, it was the planning committee who made the decision on the outline application. So that was a condition imposed by the committee um, as per the minutes that are appended, I think, in, a, uh, right. in one of the appendices to this report. Right. OK, so that's clarification one. All right. But there was a reason for that. And that reason hasn't changed, has it? The fact that no, we've it's... got um, uh, potential lack of capacity through the others. Um, but it hasn't changed insofar as Anglian Water didn't raise objection to connection to Bartlow Road at um, in, in 2016. Um, and Linton Parish Council submitted their report and obviously members made a decision on the wording of the condition at that stage. Um, and we're back here today in a similar situation where Anglian Water are not objecting to connection to, to Bartlow Road, as has very well explained. Um, but again, the Parish Council have submitted their report again. So it's, it's again handing it to members to make that balanced decision. Okay. Well, uh, Anglia Water is, I presume you are aware of the problem with uh, was it, what's the number? The final broad one, the bar, whatever the other B road is. You are aware of the backing up and the overflow that has been occurring. On Bartlow Road, yes. sorry. Yes, so, yeah, so again, that's the surface water issue, which then surcharges the sewer. And um, I just, I don't know if it helps, but just to touch on a point about the the future that um you've mentioned is that we we recognize that climate change is happening obviously and, and what we're going to do is put flow monitors in the village to ensure that the surface water um the um, we can understand that surface water inundation more in detail and identify where it's coming from and when it happens so that we can then share that with the lead local flood authority and, and monitor that closely and it will be monitored over a 12-month period um, I, don't, I don't know if that has answered your, your questions or concerns. Not really. It doesn't help now, does it? Because you've not done that analysis, have you? You've not done that no, but it goes. We can only do the analysis on what that foul, connect, that foul network is built for and the foul flows that are going in because that surface water shouldn't be there. It should be managed elsewhere. Uh, thank you. I... We'll be going around in circles if I can. Okay, thank you very much. And Dr. Councillor Dr. Claire Donaldson, you're fine. Councillor Deborah Roberts. Thank you, Chairman. Through you, Chairman. Um, just a bit of clarification, really, here, and following on from um, Dr. Councillor Toomey Hawkins. At page 40, sorry, page 455 on the paper copies. Um, and paragraph 35, Linton Parish Council, it actually says there, which confirms what Dr. Hawkins has just been saying, uh, the condition imposed on the OL approval was that the site drain should link to Manhole 7501. This is in part of a newer drain near Emerson's Close. The perilous, perilous, parlous, parlous, can't even say the word, ignorance is bliss. The parlous state of the drainage system at the eastern end of the village was understood by Southampton District Council Planning Committee and was the reason for the specific condition that the sewage link should be by manhole 7501, not to manhole 2503 or any of the Barclow Road. Yeah, that, that's the Parish Council's report, yeah. Yeah, but that is what we... Yes. 
that's the information we received and what we took on board. Mm -hmm. And so what's changed? Thank you. And Councillor Dr. Martin Khan. Can, can I ask Anglo Water again? Um, the, you have to, uh, Anglo Water is not objecting to connection to her, the manholes in Bardlow Road. Um, but not objecting is not the same saying which would be the better. Which would be better from your point of view, uh, connection to Barclay Road or connection to the 7501? Which would cause least problems and be the most acceptable solution, not necessarily whether it's not going to be objectionable to different things? So <laughs> e either, either solution, both options, there's capacity within that network to accommodate those flows. Um, if there wasn't capacity, we would state that and we manage that um, mitigation that's required. So we have done that assessment and, and either connection point does does work in terms of the capacity. Just, just I don't know if, if it's okay to bring it up now, but just to be clear, the developer has the right to connect to the nearest connection point of a, of a pipe that can serve that development site and that is Bartlow Road. So Either, either option would work in terms of capacity, in terms of legislation, the developer has a right to connect um, un, under the Water Industry Act to that connection point in Bartlow Road. We take one, each one in its own um, rights, but we do know that there are connections between these two. We have just said, in terms of the surface water drainage, that we did not accept that. And that is something that needs to be dealt with. And as we understand, this is about the foul water drainage. And, and I'm, even though I um, say, I agree with you know, what's changed, what perhaps, you know, we didn't have um, angling water there at the time, and I think here, so what we've got here is, once again, it's technically acceptable what's being proposed. The developer has the right to do it. Um, and yes, we do know that surface water has an impact on it. And we have just said we're not, we didn't accept the surface water because it's not right. But actually in this one, it is simpler. Um, and, and I have heard the parish council as I'm thinking about this, but I am also listening to the statutory consultee. So this is, for me, a slightly different one to the previous application. And I would be, um, and I think, you know, in terms of that balance, I'm more on the balance on this one and saying that I find it very, very hard to find an objection at this moment in time on that one. And would be looking to move to a vote, but we, once we've heard of the reasons why not. Um, Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was just wondering if it's possible, I, th I thought I saw on the team screen um, something from Councillor John Batchelor. I was wondering, as, as the as his local member, whether we could it might be something that's helpful to our decision making. Sorry, I didn't. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. That's all right. I oh, carry on shivering. Um, a message appeared to pop up from Councillor John Batchelor in the on the Teams, and I'm just wondering it might it might be helpful to our decision making. Well, it, it may or may not. We're not actually supposed to use the chat, and I haven't got oh. it in front of me. But we're, we and I think. A certain councillor knows that we're not supposed to be using the chat to have a separate, non-transparent debate um, that, that's not happening in the chamber. So we should actually be saying that the chat is only for us to speak. Um, okay. But, and we've passed the moment where we had Councillor John Batchelor to... Okay. I tried to give him give him a chance. I'll let you tell yep. him off, Chair. Yes, thank you. Good. Um, Not, no, the other local member is not um, having any intervention in this aspect. So that's where I am. I'm, and so I don't know if where anybody else is, but I, at this moment, would think that we go to the vote on this one. Second that, Chair. Thank you very much. And I did write down where we are on this one, though, which is on page 472 in the printed pack. which is paragraph 129, the recommendation. And this is um, that officers recommend that the committee grants delegated authority to officers to issue a new planning commission, subject to conditions set out below, with any variation to condition 10 agreed by chair and vice chair, and conditional on the completion of a deed of variation to attach the section 106 from the 2017. Okay. 
oh, I see, to attach the seven, section 106 from the 2017 outline consent to the current section 73 application. Is that correct, Michael, in terms of that's the, still the recommendation? Uh, that is correct, yeah, just, just for clarity that obviously this would be a new commission, so the, the deed of variation would make sure that the planning obligation attached to the original yes. outline is, is brought forward. Yeah, absolutely. So that's belt and braces. Um, okay, uh, members, so if, um, could we now go to Chris? I am having one. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the motion. If people were voted to refuse, that the reasons for refusal, Chris? So I think the reason for refusal would be very similar to the last item, referencing the same policies, but in, in this case, that the alternative uh, foul sewer connection uh, is not considered to be acceptable um, by the council um, and therefore not accord with policies CC 7, 8 and 9. Is that acceptable to everybody? Good. Okay, thank you. If we go to the vote, members. Okay, and we have, um, that has been refused, so we have seven refused and against three who have approved. Thank you very much, members. And we move to now item number eight, and I think Councillor uh, Henry Batchelor will rejoin us. This is on pages 531 to 562 in your agenda pack. Hello. <laughs> Get warm. <laughs> oh, yes. Councillor Peter Bain, if you could make sure that you're logged back into the respective microphone, please. Okay. Yeah. Good. So we are on agenda item eight. This is for application S slash two five five three slash sixteen slash condition H from the Ward of Linton, Parish of Linton for the land off Horse Heath Road. Proposal for submission of details required by condition twelve, foul water drainage of planning permission S slash two five five three slash sixteen slash outline. For outline planning application with all matters reserved for up to 42 dwellings and allotments at not less than um, 0.45 hectares. The applicant is Crowdace Homes and the key material considerations for us members foul water drainage and neighbour amenity. It's not a departure um, from policy and it's been brought to the committee because the application is one that in the opinion of officers in consultation with chair and vice chair should be determined by committee because of special planning policy considerations complexity of the application, um, which is significant and of strategic importance to an area beyond both the specific site and parish. And the presenting officer is Karen Pelkovin. Are you with us? Karen? I am indeed. Thank you, Chair. Hello. Hi there. Afternoon. Um, right. Just before we start, I'll do a short verbal update. Yeah. So in terms of we have received three additional representations since the publication of the report which was a letter from the uh, lucy fraser the mp to uh chief executive of south cams linton parish council and a local resident in summary following concerns from the parish council and local residents in relation to the unauthorized development continuum in on, on the site and potential flood risk given the recent flood the MP has requested that the condition in relation to foul drainage is considered at the same time as the planning committee meeting as the condition in relation to surface water drainage. Basically, the development proposes two separate systems, one for foul water and one for surface water. These are disconnected from each other. Foul water is proposed via the foul water sewer, whereas surface water is proposed via sustainable drainage systems in the form of an infiltration to the ground via a basin and permeable paving. With regards to foul water drainage, Anglian Water and the drainage officer and environmental health officer have not raised any objections to the scheme. 
The enforcement action in relation to the foul drainage scheme was not considered necessary, given that it would not be in use until the development is occupied. In any case, works were advised to stop on the foul drainage connection. The responses received from all parties are based on the submitted information for the flood drainage application. Anglian Ward has advised that the Parish Council's independent drainage report follows similar principles to its assess assessment. However, it has overestimated the dry weather flow in the sewer network. However, it does know there are surface water contributions in the foul only system, obviously, which has just been discussed previously. Um, does not have a lot of complaint history for Linton and to ensure it understands the full extent of surface water in the foul network, it is installing flow monitors in the village. This will show the dry weather flow baseline and help identify the amount of surface water and the sewage response in rainfall events. It's evident from the recent flood that there's also an overland flow issue, surface water entering the network from this overland flow, and it will work with the lead local, excuse me, lead local flood authority to share its findings. Basically, in conclusion, there is dry weather flow capacity in the current network to accommodate both the development sites without mitigation. A connection has already been made at the top of Lonsdale and this has been approved. The on-site on foul network and foul pumping station has not been submitted to Anglian Water for adoption and it will be managed privately. We have agreed to drop, adopt the surface water underground on-site pipes network but not the Suds Features Attenuation Pond. After the flood event, the network at Lonsdale was inspected and an error was recognised in the asset mapping. A new assessment was carried out and the, sand, and the site can connect without mitigation to the foul network. We've also got a new map, which I will show in my presenta presentation shortly. Also, on site after the surface water from Horse Heath Road site went into the foul drainage, they lifted manhole covers in Lonsdale and Baker's Lane and CCT was carried out within the sewer in Lonsdale. It was running as it should have been with no damage or connections. Anglian Water therefore have no objections to the scheme. The foul drainage scheme is not required to be redesigned. Just a little bit with regards to surface water drainage, because a lot of issues have been raised with regards to that. A temporary stop notice was issued on the site on the 24th of February 2021 um, in relation to the surface water drainage as the original application was refused. This stopped work on the site for 20, 28 days in order for new information to be submitted. The applicants have been advised to stop work since the expiring of the stop notice continued, but no further formal action has been authorised. However, works were advised to stop on the surface water scheme. A new application has been submitted and <clears throat> at the current time, the lead local authority have no objections to the application. However, the Parish Council still raise concerns and they are currently being taken into consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So bear with me, I will just go on to my presentation now. Um. So can you see a presentation? Yep, I'm just trying, bear with me. <laughs> yep, it is now. Uh, it's okay. in presentation mode now. Oh, okay. Yep. Yes. I think you're, 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 we're seeing your screen now for some reason. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. It's all right. On my screen, I've got the slideshow mode. <laughs> so before you before you did whatever you did at the last minute, we we saw the there uh, yeah we saw the presentation mode. This one? No, if you now go into you went up then to presentation mode, didn't you? And we saw it. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to try. Yeah. 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 Just so it's in presentation mode now. No. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I did try. There we go. Don't do anything else. Okay. 
<laughs> okay, it's not on my screen in presentation, mate. That's probably why. So okay, okay. So this is an application for discharge of condition twelve, foul water drainage of outline planning application for forty two dwellings and allotments to the lands to the south of Horsey Road in Linton. So just going to the next slide. This is the location plans showing the site. So Horseheath Road goes along the top of the site. Um, you have this line here is Baker's Lane running southwards from the southwest corner. And Lonsdale is the residential road to the west. So South, just to make it clear, South Cams do own a strip of land along the eastern boundary of the site, which is shown in this next slide which the developers do need to cross that land to connect to the manhole in Lonsdale in Linton. So the approved, oh, sorry. Approved site, site layout for the development. So you have 42 houses, houses on the frontage there, which come down. And then in the southwest corner, there is an area of public open space. Um, within that public open space is the proposed infiltration basin for the surface water drainage scheme. Um, you have a main adopted road into the site, which comes down here. Um, and then this area to here to the eastern side is allotments. So in terms of the foul drainage, <clears throat> that that's quite small, that plan, so I have done a larger plan, but basically it's a private fat of pumping station on the site, which will be in this location, um, slightly larger. So this is plot number 31 here. The private pumping station will be in this location and there will be pipes to the east of that, which will run along the front of the houses and then go along between plots 33 and 34 and then northwards and they'll be at that point there will be a holding sort of area before it connects to the manhole in Linton. Basically the, capac um, the capacity of the pumping station is 24,480 litres which incorporates 150 litres per person per 24 hours. It'll be pumped two to three times per day that's the rate to be agreed with Anglian water, which I understand to be five litres per second. <clears throat> yeah, when it reaches Lonsdale, it will go into the main public sewer system to the south along Lonsdale. So just in terms of the previous map on the site, this shows, so this is the map that Anglian water had originally, basically shows the, so the blue is the surface water pipe and the brown is the foul water pipe and the foul water pipe originally went eastwards from the bottom of Lonsdale um, before connecting to Bartlow Road which is down here. The new basically investigations on the site have been carried out and the new flood water map shows the new route or well, not the new route but the accurate route of the foul water pipe which actually instead of going this way to the east actually runs west and then comes along here before going reaching Bartlow Road. Um, just some details of the foul pump system. So the actual foul pump in terms of its above ground it's a manhole um, sort of cover above the ground but then you do have a telemetry system which is a 24 hour system which basically monitors um, the you know levels of such within the pump to ensure it's working correctly etc um, so that is above ground I do have a photograph if you did need to see that um, so the key considerations in relation to the proposal are foul drainage and the impact upon noise uh, neighbour immunity in terms of noise and odours thank you Topics for today for debate, which is 
this is a different situation from the prior one in terms of our legal context, um, and that we defer this item so that it is considered together with the surface water drainage. So we understand that technically they are separate systems, but as we've just heard, they are interconnected. They were supposed to be pre-commencement, and that would affect the design. So that committee, um, um, that that committee would be able to consider both at the same time, just as today we've considered both at the same time. And so that's what I would like to move that motion, members. And I've seen that Councillor Williams um, has seconded that motion. Um, are we able to go? And the reasons for that? Do I need to? Thank you. Oh, <laughs> we're okay to go to a vote on that one? Unless, can we do that by affirmation? Agreed. Thank you. Glad you came back. Yeah, that was a quick one. Oh, thank you. Um, and to address the, the speakers who are ready and have been on, on most of the applications actually today, so to the parish council who are about to speak again, thank you very much. I hope that um, there is some satisfaction in that proposal to defer. And I, once again, I really like to appreciate um, the work that's being done. And we know that there's been constant engagement by the case officer in this. Um, so thank you very much. And also to Anglia Water and um, to the Lead Flood Authority to come and to, to be here so that we can talk with you and understand these things. So thank you very much for your time and being made available. Members, so that means that we, um, and what did Ian prompt me to say at that time? So members, we have um, items on the agenda, are nine and 10. Both of those are update reports on the section 106 and then um, revoking a TPO before going on to enforcement and appeals. So. It's 3.15, it was, you know, we were kind of looking at a 3.30 break, um, but I'd like to suggest that given what we've just happened now, that we at, at least do one more item. Yep, is that okay? Is everyone okay that we, we move on? Thank you very much, good. So we go to item number nine, which is Bourne Airfield, pages 563 to 590 in your agenda pack. Oh, okay. Chair, it just occurred to me, I need to declare another non-pecuniary interest. My employer has previously had a business relationship with the applicant, but no longer does. So I'm not precluded from taking part in this one, just for openness. Thank you very much. You. That will be noted, I think. This is for application S-3440-18, outline um, for Bourne Airfield Bourne, and the parishes of Bourne Highfields Caldicott. The proposal is for an outline planning application with all matters reserved except for access. Yeah, 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 we're not considering the application. Sorry, yes, you're absolutely right. This is the, the proposal is for that, but what we're considering is an update. Sorry, got into my stride there. Thank you very much. It's going to be an update report on how we've got on with the section 106 to date because we did ask for a review of that because we're really concerned on our strategic sites, the strategic review, what's happening with the section 106, seeing as you know, viability has often been one of these very important issues, um, significant issues. So we could move directly to the report by the officer. Yeah. And Kate, are you with us? Yes, I am. And so this is being brought to committee because you're going to update us on the S106 agreement. Thank you. That's right. It is indeed an update report on the Section 106 for Bourne Airfield New Village. I can advise you that overall good progress has been made on the Section 106 agreement and many items have been tentatively agreed, subject to finer detail. Officers and the applicant have now agreed a revised target date of the end of October for signing the agreement. And just for clarification, the report is for noting and no decisions are required to be made. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? Councillor Dr. Tumi Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, 
to say thank you to uh, Katie for all the work she's done on this. Um, I just wanted some clarification, really. Um, I'm kind of... Uh, right. If we go to page, the table on the printed papers 567, where Appendix it talks one. about... Mm -hmm. um, where it talks about the item 6, special needs education. So the contribution is towards an off-site school at North Stowe. That seems to be a long way for kids to go to school with special needs. Will this be including the transport for them to get there and back? Um, that's number one. Number two is on page 570, item 34. This is the cycleway links to Bourne, Caldecott, and Camborne. I think Katie might understand where I'm going with this because <laughs> um, we have had a request from Bourne for a cycleway from uh, the new Bourne Airfield village down to Bourne village itself. Is that included? And also 41, paragraph 41, what do we mean by wider improvements to footpath network? Thank you. Uh, through you, Chair. Uh, thank you. Thank you for those comments. Um, with regard to the special needs, yes, the, um, the County Council have requested that it, it should go to the school at North Stow. Um, I believe that there is consideration for the transportation of children there, but I'm sorry, I don't know the details off the top of my head. I could come back to you at a later date on that. Uh, the other item you raised was a cycle network. There is um, a condition as well as the Section 106 agreement that deals with connecting the proposed new village up to uh, Camborne, uh, Highfield, Caldicott and, and Bourne. Um, now, the condition does omit the word Bourne, the village Bourne in, in it, and um, we're looking to see whether that can be included. Um, and that's currently under discussion with the Highway Authority. Um, we are looking to provide that connection in the master plan, um, the parameter plans, connections are shown. Good connections, a variety of good connections are shown, fairly straightforward, direct ones that follow Broadway and run parallel to Broadway and through the centre of the site. Um, and the Highway Authority, uh, along with the applicant, are also looking at a temporary provision because it's going to take about 27 years to develop out the whole site. So they are looking at a, a temporary provision in the Section 106 agreement to connect up to those three adjoining villages. Um, as I said, it's, it is still work in progress, and that is what we're looking to achieve. Thank you. Um, the final item. My apologies, you might have to remind me what your third question was. Paragraph 41, line 41 of the table, sorry. The wider improvements to footpath network. Right. Um, it's just, it sounds vague. Yes, um, the details of that, again, are currently under discussion between the applicant and the highway authority. So I can't confirm exactly what that, the details of that will be. Um, it's, it's still a matter under discussion. Uh, thank you, thank you, Chair. So what I, what I noted it was in it was in the it's in the second table as well, isn't it? So it's kind of it was there. It's just we haven't got the details into sure. into that one yet. Okay. And thank you, Katie. Yes. Councillor Dr. Donaldson. Yes, um, I just want to come back on Councillor uh, Dr. Hawkins' ah. point about the special education needs. I think and to press that the financial contribution includes transport, really important. Good, yeah. No further, and just to thank very much, you know, often we just don't, 
see when we put all those conditions in and we, we really, really argue with Section 106, we don't see all the hard work that then goes on prior to that and then during it to make sure it's happening and negotiated out. And on these strategic new towns, which are, it's so, so important. So thank you very much. I'm very glad that we're going to have, you know, the reviews of this because it's key. So thank you. We now go on to agenda item 10, which is the Water Beach New Town East Strategic Site Section 106 update, um, which is similar to what we've just heard. So that's 591 to 622 in our printed pack. And Mike, hello. Hello. Good. So okay. Mike, do you, yes, we're look, looking forward to the update from you. Thank you, Chair. My, my text will be very similar to Kate. Um, so what I can say is good progress has been made on the drafting of the Section 106. Many items have been agreed, subject to details. We do not have a completion date yet. The report is for noting. Um, something I wanted to comment on, and hopefully Chris Carter can confirm as well, um, I'm pleased to hear that there will be a further period of public consultation on the draft document before it's signed off. So it gives um, myself, <laughs> others, and um, the Parish Council another um, chance to input on such a huge scheme. Yeah, Chair, through you, we have agreed um, to make a, a, a more developed draft available for um, review by the parish um, and others. Um, I don't know if we're quite at that point yet. Um, I'm sure Mike will confirm, but um, once we reach that point, we'll, we'll agree to do that. Yeah. Thank you. That's, That's correct. Good. Thank you. So, Chair, if I can just confirm what, what Mr Carter said. Um, yes, so once we've got to the stage where it's re ready for people to comment on it, because obviously we don't want people to comment on something that's not quite finished yet. And then when it's ready for them to comment, we'll publish it on, online and invite comments. Good, thank yeah. you very much. And I think that's, you know, exercise of very good practice, I think, you know, so that's excellent. Thank you very much. Good. Um, Mem oh, sorry, Councillor Peter Payne. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm afraid I'm gonna take us back to uh, something that's been under discussion for a long time. The first item, of course, is 30% affordable accommodation. I appreciate this is subject to viability. I wonder if there's any prospect of some conditionality on that, such that if it proves subsequently that uh, the, the, the viability test was uh, pessimistic, let's say, it might be possible to raise the extent of affordability. As I understood, as we approved it, this is exactly how we get more affordable housing, and this was really well negotiated by housing, but that's exactly what our condition was about. But Mike, you can perhaps elucidate more. Thank you, Chair. Yes, so we've got, um, if members will recall, when, with both thinking about the new town as, as a whole, because that's obviously one of the things that we, we're trying to look at the whole, is that for, um, for the eastern half, we were thinking more about both, both sides of the new town have viability process. And the western half, the viability process is predicated on affordable housing first and then transport second. On the eastern half, we were looking at transport first and affordable housing second. Um, and then um, with the target being, um, I think for the, for the western half, it was for up to 40% affordable housing, then additionality would then go on to transport. Um, Eastern half transport first, then affordable housing up to 40% after that. So it was it was balancing two two very important strategic elements, affordable housing and transport. Thanks, thanks, Mike. And I think the communications about this, we do, we do need to have better communications about it because it, it sort of as it's written here, it sort of seems if it's 30%, but we all know as we did those negotiations, we had multiple briefings on it. This is yep. all to get us up to that, that 40%. That's correct, that's correct, Chair. And, and the development over this 
length of time is at least, I know Kate talked about Bourne being 27 years. For Water Beach, who knows the length of time, but it's going to be at least 20 years, if not more. Uh, viability appraisals at various stages during that development will, will, will deliver more. Okay, and the preferred options we're trying to accelerate it, aren't we? That... That's correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, Councillor Judith, could we talk again? Yeah, I uh, apologise. I meant to mention this. Um, with, with the public consultation, so that's like parity with urban and civic. So on BCC, that both sides of Newtown have been treated in the same way from that point of view. Um, of course, it, at the end of the day, it's one whole new town, not two separate developments. Okay, good. We go to agenda item 11, um, which is to revoke a tree protection order on page 623 in the agenda pack. Well, this is for TPO 0005, gosh, 0005, this is TPO in 1985, 10 Burton and West Wickham. Um, the proposal is to revoke tree preservation order, which is no longer current, and the recommendation is to revoke the order. Um, it's brought to the committee, as we know, as happened in previous committee meetings, because it's required under the council scheme of delegation. I don't think we've got Miriam with us, have we? Jabe. Good afternoon. Hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Jay. Nice to have you with us. Thank you. I'll just start then. Yes, please. Okay. Can you see my slide? Yes, perfect. Okay. This item involves tree preservation order number five of 1985, located at 10 Burton End, 10 Burton End, West Wickham. The order protected one ash tree. The tree was felled with permission given on the 14th of February 2013 due to the poor structural condition of the tree. The decision notice is on file. There are no outstanding matters relating to this order and we seek to revoke it and remove it from the register. Thank you. So it, it was approved, so it was just a case that that just didn't happen within, it wasn't audited at the time in terms of a TPO. Yep, so I think, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that, that's a, that's a, a rousing cry of agreed there, Jay. So yes, you're having a very different day than most here. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Yeah, and thank, yes, thank, thank you for waiting. An, an indeterminate time. Thank you for waiting very much. Good. Members, we go to agenda item 12, which is the enforcement report on page 625. Chair, um, that's actually going to be me oh. now. Um, <laughs> the, the enforcement officer uh, has suffered a power cut in his street, um, and um, it's not proposed to be fixed until half past four, so I'm afraid I've got some updates for you that he sent through um, from his phone. So, um, if you're okay, That's I'll... That's very I'll, kind I'll, of him I'll, to send through on his phone. I'll, I'll read these out. So, um, with regard to North Stowe um, and the recent incident of piling on one of the parcels on phase one, um, a temporary stop notice was served on the 21st of September to cease the piling, um, and the enforcement team are currently collating evidence from residents to commence a prosecution due to them being in breach of the notice. Um, all works have since stopped in respect of piling. Um, Hayden Way, Willingham, a breach of condition notice has been served on the 23rd of September with regard to piling on site again, um, and a meeting's being arranged with members and residents as soon as possible. Um, Barklow Road, uh, we've obviously spent some time discussing this afternoon, and I think the enforcement team will need to um, consider next steps following the decisions that have been made today. Mm -hmm. Um, and the same with um, Horsey. Uh, Burwash Manor, um, application uh, 2103587 has been submitted for the retention of two pieces of play equipment um, and the introduction of an acoustic fence. And so any enforcement action is now on hold pending the outcome of that application. Uh, Smithy Fen, um, the report by Ivy Legal has been completed um, and is currently with Stephen Kelly, the joint director. Uh, for review. 
and cottage nursery. Um, there's a multi-agency meeting taking place tomorrow to arrange and discuss um, interests uh, uh, for a site visit, um, but also to limit the number of people in attendance So that one's moving forward. And finally, um, Whitehall Farm, application 2103532, um, has now been submitted and validated, so it's under consideration. Uh, I'm happy to take note of any questions, but I hope members will appreciate I won't have the answers immediately, um, but happy to report back. Thanks, Good, thank you. So we have um, Councillor Heather Williams first. Um, not logged out, Chair. Is that working? Yeah. Um, it was just on on our on my one. I sort of had a bit of conflicting that they had submitted an application, and in here it says they haven't submitted an application, and then I've also got something that says that they submitted an application and it was invalid. So. Um, could I just get a bit of clarity as as to where we're at? So sure. Obviously not from yourself, but from South London. That, that's fine. I, I might be able to help. So the report was obviously originally published on the 8th of September. The email from the enforcement officer today says that the application has been submitted and validated. So it should now be live. Yeah. Which was that one on? Uh, Whitehall Farm. Oh, right. Yeah. And Councillor Dr. Jimmy Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, Burwash Manor Farm. This has been going on and on and on <laughs> and on. <laughs> um, the latest is that we've had uh, the prosecution file drafted. And then once complete, we'll be reviewed by legal. There's no time frame to this. Is there a, an end in sight at all? is my question. Can we be given some time scale? Because this, this is now getting a bit silly. Uh, I'll take that back, Chair, but just to highlight the update I was given uh, this afternoon is that there's now a planning application for the retention of two pieces of play equipment and the introduction of acoustic fence. Um, I don't know if that's the same enforcement issue, but um, in the normal course of events, the local planning authority would be expected to determine that application first before then proceeding with enforcement action. Um, but I will seek an update from the enforcement officer and ask them to come back to the council with me. Thank you. But I think the point here is this enforcement should have taken place ages ago. We've been dragging this, frankly. It is a little Alice in Wonderland Hobbit House kind of thing, isn't it? So um, can I just say something, and, and please do take this to our, our enforcement team, which is... They did act on the horse he throat, and they did do a temporary stop and pause, and I think that was absolutely necessary, and I'd just like to say, we don't often hear it, thank you. Thank you for taking action, and timely, and that has helped you know, feed back into what we've been considering. So. Oh, Councillor Heather Williams. Sorry, there was just, just one um, small thing. So that's my page 627. I have no idea what it is for yours, but it's notice served. Just that the village is, is Croydon but rather than the ward. So one, the ward is the Mordens, but just something somewhere is slightly awry, just so it doesn't get carried on in the future. Oh, right, okay. 831? 631. 631. 631. Yes. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, and... And then appeals. So. Agenda items, but yeah, uh, no particular update, Chair. But uh, happy to take any questions. Yeah. Dr. Richard Williams. Thank you, Chair. This is just for clarification. Page six three five, um, Great Abington it says decision split. I don't know what that means. It's the clock. I mean, we are often split, but we usually. Go one way or the other, by majority. Uh, so the planning inspectorate have the power to issue a split decision if there are two elements of a scheme which are discernible from one, from one another. Um, I'll ask that the decision notice is, well, it will be on the public file, but um, the planning inspector's decision, but um, otherwise I can get it circulated. Yeah, it'd be nice and useful to have a bit of detail on what the split means. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. If you 
could just ask officers, um, maybe Stephen and Chris, um, to give some sort of clarification. Uh, how far behind are we still on the peels? Because the, the Apple Acre uh, Park at Falmere still hasn't had a date given. I mean, and it must be a good, it's been about 18 months, it must be. I mean, I know we've had the COVID and everything slipped, but um, you know, what sort of time thing are we on now, please? I don't immediately know the answer to that, but you are right. That one's been around I think, as long as I have here. Um, so um, I'll see if I can find out. I know the planning inspectors do publish. <laughs> the planning inspectors do do uh, do publish. Um, you know their time frame for decision making for different types of appeals. Um, so I'll see if I can find that for you and, and let you know. Um, Deborah Williams. Thank you. Um, just on um, the land at Mill Lane, Sawston. At the last meeting, we had sort of like some concerns about room venues and stuff like that. I take it that's all addressed, and as it stands, we're good to go on the 18th of October. Uh, Chair, if I may. Mm -hmm. um, it's in that week, but I don't think it's actually on the 18th. And as I understand it, the appeal will be in one of the sports pavilions at Campbell. So I can circulate details if that's helpful. Good. Okay. Um, and with that, thank you, everybody. Thank you to all those online, if you're still with us. Thank you, everybody in the chamber. Thank you, members, and thank you, officers.